What's up? Silas here. And I'm back for Dishing on Dish. The next Dishing on Dish. Next Dishing on Dish. Dishing on Dish series. It's a subsection of the You Are What You Consume series where me and my friend Stephen and eventually other people talk about food in specific and we go into details about the actual dishes. And today, Stephen has been to a restaurant that we mentioned. We might have mentioned it before in the previous series of Season Out, which just finished. The recording today is just posted the last part today. And the Season Out, he was working at that place before and it's closed. But this one now is also a top restaurant. It's one that y'all can go to because it's open and it's reopened. And Stephen finally went and checked it out. And Stephen, tell us a bit about what we're going to be talking about today. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're well. Today we're going to be discussing Gabriel Kreuther. This is a higher-end higher French restaurant. The chef is from Alsace-Lorraine, so you're going to see some of those themes. For those who don't know, Alsace-Lorraine is the region that borders Germany. It went back and forth between France and Germany in different wars, so you'll see a lot of Germanic influence in the culture as far as sauerkraut, well, in the cuisine, I should say. You'll see as far as sauerkraut, sausage, um, apples things like that so there's it's it's definitely like the more germanic part of france so you, so he he does a bit of those themes but at the same time it doesn't strictly adhere to that so gabriel kreuther for those who don't know again he's from alsace lorraine he's had a very distinguished career in the city he used to be chef de cuisine at jean georges that's one of the top places here he used to have it used to have three michelin stars i think they lost one unfortunately he was chef de cuisine and what's interesting is that um, my old boss, Ryan DePersio, who's the chef owner of Botello, actually worked under him when he was the chef there, which I think is pretty cool. And then he was the executive chef at The Modern. That's the restaurant in MoMA, for those who don't know. That has, that has, I want to say, two Michelin stars currently. It had one when he was there. A lot of people were surprised it didn't get two when he was there. But he broke off, went and started his own place named Gabriel Kreuther after him. Um which got two Michelin stars, so I can proudly say I've now eaten two Michelin star food. A lot of people were surprised he didn't win two when he was at the Modern, but he was, you know, he was very talented chef. the The restaurant itself is located; it's right above Bryant Park on the north end. So you can walk if you walk by the north end of Bryant Park, you'll see it. There's an outdoor dining area. There's also, of course, indoor dining. With the pandemic, you know, a lot of people have been sitting outside. I've I sat outside when I went there. Really nice, uh, really nice. Uh, establishment i mean dining room is very beautiful hopefully eat inside too at some point um the restaurant again it's it's higher end the dress code is actually business casual uh some people will come wearing suit and ties i mean i just had a nice shirt on i know it's one of those places that i'm, I'm sort of glad i called an ass in advance because i know certain places they won't let you in unless you dress a certain way um mm -hmm. as far as as far as the menu here it's open for both lunch and dinner um so there's a lunch prefix as well as dinner prefix for Dinner, the prefix, it's 135 for three courses. That's what I did. There's 160 for four courses. That's what our friend Andrea did when we went together. And there's also a chef's tasting, which is six courses for $215. Now, the, sh the chef's tasting is basically – it's dependent on the day. I mean if you have dietary restrictions, they'll factor that in. But it's basically the chef's choice as far as what he wants to send you. So likely – smaller versions of what you see on the menu plus maybe throw in a special here and there uh of course they have a great great wine selection we'll cover a few wines here and uh, he also actually sells his own chocolates which are sold at a place nearby which is pretty cool we had a few which we'll get into towards the end of the meal and i'm, I'm thinking maybe in the future i'll buy some for the next uh, special occasion all right thoughts and hmm. comments yep. Yeah, with uh, this, it's uh, <laughs> the Shoe and Dish series. It's specifically where uh, Stephen and um, especially other people, as you mentioned, but right now Stephen has been uh, glad enough. I mean, he eats. We all eat. We like to eat. Most people like things about food and things like that. So, with this series in specific, we like this talking about this food in specific, going to the details on foods. And Stephen has a long history of working in the food service industry, both front of the house and back of the house. And then outside of that, he's researched more into the food and things like that. And he's a bit of a bit of a gourmand, I would say. <laughs> he goes around to different places, and I personally cook for myself. And I'm not anywhere close to his gourmand or anywhere close to his aware about the things. But I just like information, and he's very he's very well educated and informed on these different things and just discovering different things. So far in the New York City area, but we've talked about ideas of eventually expanding this and adding more people to it. And this is, a, as I mentioned, a subsection of the You Are What You Consume series, which is just essentially that series of conversations we had was about different things about what we consume as human beings that physically makes up our physical bodies, but also the ideas and the thoughts and the other things that we consume and appropriate in that sense, and also the things that come together to make the foods and the things that we've talked about, uh, the friends 
Sichuan. We've talked about things like how do certain foods become actual classic recipes. We've talked about things of how the this food industrial complex has come to be and how that actually applies into certain civilizations and cultures and how it develops and how certain places are able to do certain things once you've freed yourself from that basic need of life of just finding your next meal. So with this one, it's going full in the details, more of like a foodie type of thing. And I really enjoy this series. We've talked about six different restaurants so far. I think it was, uh, the first one was Mineta Tavern. The mm. second one was Huertas. Then we talked about uh, Dini Bistro. Then we talked about Casa Mono. And then we talked about Seasonal. I'm missing one in there. That, uh, there was a burger one, special one. We yeah. talked about burgers themselves. So that was the six different ones. And we've already gotten <laughs> some back. Where Steven has been back to some of these restaurants. We've talked to other people. He's been telling people and sharing these videos. And we've had very good uh, reception for it. So thank you all for the people who are commenting and enjoying this as we enjoy talking about it. So this is something that we'll be working on, working on a few other projects as well. But this is something that's been growing with that. And with this one... Um, we're probably going to get this done in one, but we have a lot of other things set up and ready for the next um, for the next bit. We will try to release these once a week. Now, um, when we start talking about an actual restaurant, we normally go over the place, the look and the subsection of the place. We talk about the location, the tables, and the ambiance. Stephen has touched on some of those already. Then we talk a bit about the content, the menu, and the fixed price combos, seasonal, varied, and permanent. Stephen's already touched on that a bit, and we just go into the actual food where we start talking about it in detail. At that point. Our faces go off the screen. If you're watching the video version of this, um, there will be images of the food. And this time, um, last time we were talking about seasonality, it was a restaurant that Stephen worked on years ago. It was the second restaurant he ever worked on in the food service mm -hmm. industry. So the the photo and image quality had dropped compared to what we had in the series. But this is a rather recent one. So there's going to be several photos, different angles of the food, uh, details into it, of the wine, we're going to be talking about some of that. Also some videos, so um, there should be some stuff to see more exciting for than the last series for the people who are more interested in the visuals. So some of the things we'll, I think we'll touch on a bit, uh, some of the things you missed out was you, the ambiance. You didn't really mention that when you were talking about the, Tell us about the tables. How many tables are there inside and outside? And also the ambiance in the actual restaurant. I'm honestly not sure the table count. I apologize. Uh, outside, it's actually white tablecloths. Inside, I think some of the tables are white tablecloths, but there's also a bar area and there's some tables that are, I'm trying to remember if they're wooden, they're a little more solid. I'd have, I'd have to look at photos. I, I'm not sure the number of seats. I mean, I guess in the future I can go do a quick count, but it's like, I don't, I don't consider it super important. It's not a huge restaurant. I mean, generally mm -hmm. restaurants of this caliber usually aren't that high end. I like, for example, um, per se, which, you know, Thomas Keller's flagship and like they do like 150 people on like a busy night. Wow. Whereas, whereas, but that's the thing. But then like, if you go to a casual place like Bar Balloon Rice Work, we did 600 on a really busy night. So that's the point. And there are places that do even more than that. But it generally as places get higher end, they're going to do fewer people because the food becomes more intricate. There's more courses in it. You're not going to feed hundreds of people. You'll maybe feed a hundred something um, you know, on a slow night, they'll do as low as I've heard. I remember shortly before the lockdown, they said per se at nights where they were doing like 20 people, which is bad. But I oh, mean, wow. it, but it kind of makes sense because the high price point, all the courses, you're not you're not going to have people who come back three times a week. It just doesn't happen. Um, yeah. Kreuther, Kreuther, I would say, is definitely on the higher end side, but it's not like like I was saying recently. Um, this is the most money I spent in a little bit. And I was saying because uh, I was talking uh, our friend Rose went there the other day and she was saying she thought it was great, too. But I was saying. For the amount of money I spent, this is the kind of place that I would go like once a month or like a special occasion. Whereas something like with Mineta, we spent a lot less money. So it's like that's somewhere I, I can go like once a week. But then like this is more like once a month special occasion. And then like there's casual places by me that I'll go like a few times a week because I'll spend like 40 bucks. So it's like it's all those things into consideration. And I was also going to say too uh, – my our friend Andrea, aka Libertarian Wife, she's been joining me lately for dining, so maybe she can be included in this too. Um, we went to Mineta Tavern, we went to Croyther, she'll be in a bunch of these photos, and then we're gonna go to Casa Lua, the cheese place where I went yesterday. We're gonna go on Wednesday, so you're gonna probably start seeing her in the photos, and you know maybe at some point she can come on and talk to us if she has the time. Yeah. So I, I think I think you know this is sort of the start of including more people in this, and then I, I had a few other friends who talked about asking joining us as well. So you know who knows, maybe we'll get to a point where we'll, we'll go out as a group and we can start having more involvement everywhere. yeah and we have a lot of crossover with what's the synchronicity what's that co corporate term where they talk about like 
symbiosis or something like that. There's some I've heard synchronicity. There's synchronicity. 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 I've heard that. Yeah, yeah. where we're doing different projects. It's actually just we just like talking. We like we're infoholics. We like talking to each other and searching about different things. So we've been doing this for some time, and then now other people are starting to enjoy hearing us talk, and then they want to come in and talk. And there's another project we have called I Know Great People. We've done a few recordings on that. The first one was with Stephen talking about the food service industry. So if you enjoy any of the stuff here, highly suggest you check that one out at least, and then you probably enjoy the rest of the series. And with that one, we've also talked about some people. So there's going to be some people who restaurants you've actually gone to and gone to, but we'll get some of those people onto that series and they can tell us more about the restaurant themselves or the other things they do that he's met through the restaurants. And you, we've already scheduled with somebody who wants to tell us more about uh, his, he, was, he said humane raised foie gras because Stephen is human foie gras. And he's also, we're trying to, we're trying to get Stephen to Away from being a horrible human being, because you know how far Christ made. So we're, we're trying to we're trying to get and get more into also the food kind of thing. So he'll be on that series. It might cross over somewhat with this series. At least we'll definitely mention it if you're just following this series alone. Eventually, we're thinking we're to, this will be on one location. If you follow me on this actual site where you look, whenever you listen to this now, if you're following this content here, it will always remain there. But eventually, some of these might break them off into separate websites where if you just want to follow that alone, that you'll be able to get that. But yeah, that's neither here nor there for now. Or no, it's, it's not here. Okay. It's not here, but it's over there. It's it's somewhere over there. So we're here. To, it's it's over here. So we'll come back over here to where we're talking about with with this. I'm looking at the website here, and um, there seems to be some kind of. Um, it looks like some w wooden framing. It looks like almost like there will be windows, but it's like without the pane. It's it's an interesting thing with the interior. It seems kind of a, have a goldish, warmish kind of look into it. But um, you'd said at at um, Michelin star restaurants, the white tablecloth is a common thing. You also say there's no booths, but they seems to be this kind of circular type of thing that they're not technically booths, but it seems like tables are lined up on these longer kind of um, padded couch type circular half circle type of things. If you know what I mean, I don't know if you can see it on the website. Let me take a look because, again, I think it has a lot to do with the spacing as far as maybe they have a – they have something they have some seating like that but in general there tends to be a lot more space and like like for example if we if we sat outside in the patio and like there it's all white tablecloths and their space kind of far apart and there is a bar area as well which is interesting cuz yeah, even i mean even restaurants too. Even restaurants like Danielle, which had three Michelin stars, like those places have bars too. But it's but at the same time, they do have tables where you can sit and there's plenty of space. So I'm not 100 percent sure how Michelin got, rates it. But my sense is that there probably has to be the option of sitting at those tables with more space. And then there's like a bar if you want to come in, get a drink and leave. I mean, I wouldn't come here for a drink and leave. I think it's kind of a waste, honestly. But I mean, you could do that if you want to, because that's I think I'd mentioned in a previous discussion that they said that at Danielle, even if you come in to sit at the bar and have a drink, they'll send you canapes, like even though you don't order food where but like you get canapes if you even just sit there, have a drink, if you have a full meal, whatever. But I mean, again, you could do that. Like, I don't know, maybe you live in the neighborhood and it's convenient for you. But I, I don't know. I, I decided I don't really see the point of going to a high end place. I'm just getting drinks. It's like I can go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, and the drinks are already expensive enough in New York City. <laughs> There's no need to like add well, the, the, the only the only time I maybe sit at the bar to be like if I'm waiting for somebody, maybe like sit and have a drink while I'm waiting, and then once they're there, sit at a table. But you mentioned in season hour or before sometime that some places have a kitchen table, and that's for that is as it says the kitchen table. It's actually literally in the kitchen, and you can see yep. people prepare bring you stuff straight off of the of the heating implements or the out of the, out of the oven. But yeah, it's yeah. currently closed. If you're interested in that, at Gabriel Caruso, it's it's currently closed right now, but I'm sure it will open up eventually as things um, open up with the current pestilence of unknown, of unmentioned origin. Okay, hey. so <laughs> the, ne the next part we're going to talk about, uh, we just talked about the ambiance, talked about the tables, yeah. And location-wise, you said like with these places, location plays some part into it, but once you get to the Michelin levels, people hear about you and search you out. There's not too many people just coming off of food traffic. Oh, I'm a tourist. I'm hungry. I'm just going to stop at the Gabriel, Gabriel Caruso and have and spend a couple hundred dollars on, <laughs> on a dinner. That's not something that happens often, right? Well, I, I had to mention it. I mean, we did the whole segment explaining the Michelin Guide, so I'm not going to rehash it here, but the, the Michelin Guide was originally a travel guide, and the idea is they're recommending places to go to, but because they were recommending places, they had to review all these places, which is how they came up with the rating system, and then they became known for that. So, well, there's, I forget the, exactly what they say, but it's something like one star, it's like 
worth a detour, two stars, like above and beyond worth going to, and then three stars worth a special journey. And the idea is that, like I'd mentioned previously, the French Laundry is basically in the middle of nowhere, but because it's 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 been recognized as the top restaurant in America at certain points, it's worth going out of the way to go there because it's so prestigious, like people don't mind traveling way out of the way. Whereas in New York, it's a bit different, obviously, because, you know, everything's dense, everything's close together. But at the same time, there are there still are people who will come from other parts of the world and they'll eat in these places because they're so famous. Yeah. So uh, when you went, you have to you have to call ahead of time. Like you, can you even walk in and get a table? Are you, are you going to have to call ahead of time? So the, so the thing was, I, I was a little annoyed with her because she uh, she wanted to go somewhere. Uh, I think it was Mineta Tavern last minute. And I'm like, this is a popular restaurant. We can't get in here. And I'm like, why don't we go to Gabriel Kreuther? And it was like, I checked their I checked their availability, and it's like at the time I checked, they weren't available till like like Wednesday the following week. This was like Thursday or something. So then I was like, okay, if we want to go to these places, we have to reserve in advance. And then so what it is is we we went somewhere else, and um, we went to. We, then yeah, then I made a reservation the following week. I'm like, okay, it's like Wednesday at nine or something, and it's like, you know, these places are busy. I mean, the only way you can get in early is if you come at like five o'clock or something. And I always say this with Minetta Tavern. Um, I always give Andrea a time because her sense of timing isn't the best. But I explain to her like, you know, you come to a place at like five, like like Minetta Tavern. I always walk into, but I come at like five o'clock. There's nobody there. You come in at like eight or nine on like a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I mean, good luck. It's like, you know, you, you're going to need a reservation. These are popular places. That's why I like to eat early because it's like there's nobody there. I can talk to the bartender. You know, they'll send me stuff, whatever. Whereas, like, you eat it during the peak hours. It's like you're, you're, you, you get kind of lost in the shuffle. And I'm not blaming the staff because they're busy, but, like, the experience is not the same. Whereas, like, it's kind of nice to come in at Mineta, be it sitting at the bar with, like, one or two people. They can talk to me. Like, one of my guys there, he's a he's into investing as well, so we talk about that. You know, he sends me some stuff. So, like, th to me, that's more fun rather than just being in this, like, dense group of people. But because of her work schedule, we have to go later, so I'm just making do accordingly. But this is the kind of place, as with Mineta, that if you want to come on a busy day, you better have a reservation because it's, you know, they'll they'll be packed i mean minetta and i think this place too you come even like earlier in the week like on a monday it's still gonna be like it's still gonna be busy at like eight o'clock at night oh. that's uh, that is something but i guess if you if you're more this is the thing like if you if you're looking to get into this but it's it's not too big of an issue to actually do this because it's it's the amount of time and effort that's actually being put into the place other people also value that time and effort so they'll want that so supply and demand cost benefit analysis time preferences these are things that you do because even if you were trying to make any of these dishes that you'll see once we actually get into the food to actually make it yourself at home you would also have to schedule you have to go pick your time to go buy the stuff it will take time to make certain things using some actual time say so okay we're going to have to do this much time on this thing and you pull it out this time you mix this other thing into it then you put it in like this and you have to put it here to sit for this time so that amount of time is being condensed where you don't have to do all of that all you got to do is schedule let me be at x location at, at y time for z amount of uh with z amount of money and then you have that so i think that's that's something that is understandable to to be willing to undertake especially when you're going to these more high-end places where a lot more has been put into versus just the places where like you go to a five guys still amazing food really like five guys burgers but it's it's a kind of um it's more of a of a typical supply line like assembly line type of thing where it's just like the same things being pumped out, same thing being pumped out, same thing being pumped out. Whereas here there's more artistry, there's more culinary arts into this, there's more intent into this. And um, even just we talked about this some time back, and I will get into the section where we talk about the content of it, that we talked about this some time back and he was like before he actually decided to go, and then we looked at the menu and we were going through the different things, and he was telling me some things about it. And we were going through like wondering okay, what he's going to pick from it, and then he eventually went and picked some things. So it was kind of good just to see that develop from it. And yeah, it's it's an amazing menu. So right now I'm looking through the menu page, and if you are watching on the screen right now, I will have um, some short video of me just scrolling through the menu so you can see some of the things. And one of the really commendable things about this one is it has, of course, the prices there, but also has little images for the food in there. And that actually helped like spark us to, like some other thing that he hadn't considered uh, getting before. Because like one for this particular, I don't even, you didn't get the foie gras terrine. We had seen, seen the foie gras terrine, as I mentioned, as human, as human foie gras. But then we saw a different foie gras dish that we'll save till when we actually get to the actual talking about it that he decided to get instead. And and of course, it's been a baseball, so he will tell us about that when we get there. But yeah, uh, right now as we're scrolling through the menu, can you just tell us a bit about it? Like the, is this the typical number of dishes that you'd find at a Michelin two-star? And tell us a bit about the seasonality and the fluctuation of what you normally expect to see on a, on a menu in a place of, of this of this sort of uh, caliber. 
Sure. So typically, it, what you see is in, in a lot of like one and two star places, you see th menus like this where there's usually there's a bunch of a la carte options and there's a tasting option. Whereas if you go to the three star places, it's usually all tasting. Like if you if you were to go to Eleven Madison Park per se, places like that. It's all just a tasting menu. Like all you can do, there's there's usually like chefs tasting. There's usually a vegetarian tasting, things like that. Like there's no oh order this, order this, order that. Uh, I think with per se they said you can do that. Like if you ask, but like it's kind of pointless because like do you really want to go to a place, order three small plates and leave? Like you can, but it's like it's not really recommended. Because the thing is, like Thomas Keller, I think ultimately he's trying to discourage you from doing that because he wants to take you through the series of courses. Whereas if you get like like a tiny appetizer, tiny entree, tiny dessert, it's like it's not re it's not really like the full experience and this is something in between where it's sort of like a mix of like some appetizer some entree some dessert and then you can pick and choose for your prefix or you can just like let him do the tasting menu and then again if you have restrictions and now and say anything the modern where he used to run it's similar to this as well now the modern that, that could be a separate video but what's interesting there is there's two places there's the bar room and then there's the fine dining and with the bar room there it's all a la carte it's all small plates and you can just mix and match but then with the fine dining it's just a tasting that's it so like that's kind of playing to both as well and that has two michelin stars as well so if you sit in the fine dining it's like white tablecloths chef's tasting again substitute if you have restrictions they also have a cheese cart there which is pretty cool i mean not many places do that anymore but then if you sit in the bar room where i've been it's like there's a series of small plates like appetizer entree and a few desserts and you can just sort of mix and match like whatever you want like they, they sort of compared it to tapas um and this is kind of a similar thing like you could come in here like you know if you notice the pricing like there's to share like you could come in and get like a tart flambe and like an entree if you wanted to do that i mean again i wouldn't recommend that because it's going to be kind of boring but it's like but like the prefix the idea is you get more food for less money and like you can try a few different things and then chefs tasting the same thing like the amount of food you would get relative to what you pay would be more but again you are spending a little bit of money so it's to kind of encourage people to do the tasting or prefix yeah okay yeah, and um, they, they have a, a – when you go to the website and you click on the menu, it actually takes you to a different section here. Where at least it has a different uh, top menu here. But it has a lunch a la carte, which is a dining room pat patio, uh, lunch pre-free. Um, then dinner dinner a la carte, which is lounge and patio. Then dinner pre-free, which is dining room, lounge, and patio. I think the lounge is what I was seeing with those uh, with those uh, kind of half circle things that you all see yeah. when you get to the website. And then Chef Cruther's uh, kitchen table, which you said is closed, wine by the glass, cocktails, beer and cider, and zero proof, which is just non-alcoholic beverages. And that mm -hmm. has the wine list here that um, you might check out also, yeah. But yeah, so what is the seasonality? Like the amount of dishes that you know we have, I, I think, here for the dinner let me just kind of do a quick um to have a situation where you have this many this many dishes of this kind of quality with this amount of effort that goes in you're not necessarily going to have like a cheesecake factory section where there's like a, a entire massive book of, <laughs> of menus because of recipes of things you can order because most of them you just throw them in a the microwave so this is kind of the typical thing that you will expect to find at a higher-end restaurant right yeah. So typically, as you can see, there are fewer entrees. I mean, there's only a few entrees, but the thing is, these are subject to change. Um, even what I've noticed is like when we went there, some of the ingredients were tweaked a little bit. I'm sure, you know, with the chef's tasting, likely what they do is they include some courses from the menu and then probably throw in a few specials that are just on the chef's tasting. Because a lot of places I've noticed will do that where though on the chef's tasting, there will be special courses that aren't on a la carte because the idea is to incentivize you to get chef's tasting. So you might see somebody eating a course that's not on the menu and they'll be like, oh, that's cool. What is that? Oh, it's part of the chef's tasting. So it's, it's to get you to want to get the chef's tasting. So they do things like that too, okay. I've noticed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, I, the challenge level with these dishes is going to be uh, somewhat higher than yeah. the average because it is a Michelin two star. But uh, some of them you might be able to do. And uh, I just saw on the website that there is actually a new cookbook coming out. So you can mm -hmm. pre-order it so far. So, from seeing. so by the time you listen to this, it's probably going to be out already or might be out. And it's called The Spirit of Alsace. And that's by Gabriel Caruso. So you definitely can check that out. And you probably will have recipes from this restaurant and also the other restaurants that he did. And probably some extra things that he hasn't had, like, unveiled yet or that he used to have and he doesn't have. And uh, here it's also now I'm checking the wine list rather rather as you mentioned it was rather um, you mentioned before we actually got into the start recording you mentioned that it was a rather concise um, uh, wine listing and yeah it is it is rather hefty it's 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 not as big as what was the place Huertas was the one that had the massive list it was like hundreds no, of no, them that, that's Casamono because oh, yeah, um, Casamono. yeah. 
Yeah, because uh, Huertas has a few, but like they're not. I mean, Huertas is also a more casual place. But remember also, Casa Mono is owned by Joe Bastianich, who's Lydia Bastianich's son, who I used to work for. And he his background is in wine. So he he put a lot of attention into getting all these wines that he could find. Yeah. Okay. So I'm seeing the range here. I'm seeing a blend here of uh, Krug, uh, Grand Cuvée, Cuv Riems. Which is going for thirteen ninety five. I'm just like looking at the highest prices that people drop on. Okay, there's one here for twenty nine fifty, which is a crude Blue Blanc de Blanc, which is a Claude du Mesnil Riems. What does Riems mean? Is that the location? Wait, sorry, how is it spelled? R I R E I M S. Oh Blue yeah, that's Blanc a location. That's a location, okay. yeah. Um, there's one here. Uh, Close to your sister's LV. I think the LV is a number. I don't know what Roman numeral that is off the top of my head. Is that 40? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I think that's 40. Um, uh, Marcel Tsui, and that's 29.75. So, yeah, this, you, you could spend a pretty penny here, but then there's, yeah. still, there's still wines for just $100. I mean, just $100. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I mean, for, for the quality that you get, there's one here for 105, there's one for 90. Oh, it's a 55. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, let's just look at the numbers here and just seeing the different ones. Yeah, it's it's an extensive list. I think that definitely does match the Casalula. Um, no, sorry, not the Casalula. It does Casa match the Casalona uh, list most definitely. There's some here in thirty one hundred now. Yeah, yeah. It's um, I'm still scrolling. It's just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And yeah. Again, now with a place like this, where do they store all this wine? So there's usually massive cellars, usually in the basement. Uh, Bar Balud, where I used to work, was like that as well. Like, there's a certain area you go to. It's just – the way they do it, they set it up is actually kind of clever because there's, like, a hallway. But there's these wine shelves that the bottles go into, and then you can see them through glass. So you have to, like, go in there to get it. But, like, if you walk through the private space, you can actually, like, walk through these, like, areas with glass and then, like, rows of bottles. It's pretty cool, actually. Uh. And then um, okay. some places have and wine fridge – so, sorry, what I was going to say is some places also have wine fridges, which keep it at a certain temperature. The idea is that the wine should be slightly cooler, but not as cool as it would be in, like, a, your refrigerator at home. Um, I forget the exact temperature, but the thing is a lot of people, like, people who really know wines will even have those in their own homes because they want it slightly cooler, but there's an exact temperature, which they say is ideal. It's not supposed to be cold, but you don't want it room temp either. So it's, it's very temperature controlled. And, of course, once it's open, that starts to affect the quality and other things. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask with such a – diverse range of different wines and uh, did they yeah. all stay at the same room temperature like what how do wine cellars work because i can imagine there's some that might be a bit a bit, a bit different and a bit off but yeah i don't know so the lowest cost ones here i think are down in the aperitifs and the cordials of course so you'd expect those to be lowest ones in like 16 15 a couple here and some amaros what's amaro it's like a smaller version of amaretto or something it's like <laughs> i don't know no no amaro is um i'm trying to think of how to describe it um I've I've enjoyed uh, let's see it it's like it's sort of like a it's it's it actually means bitter in Italian it's kind of like a um it's an herbal liqueur it's usually um you know you usually have it uh as a digestif like you have it at the end of the meal usually like with dessert or something uh one place I actually worked with was pretty cool the chef actually did an apple pie but he did an amaro foam on top I thought that was kind of cool um mm -hmm. you know things like that because it's kind of a bitter thing like. I've gotten more in after dinner drinks lately because the thing is some are sweeter, others are like pretty dry, but it, it's a question of preference, what you're pairing it with, all that. Um, I'm not crazy about Amaro's. I mean, I've tried them a little bit. They're very bitter, so I guess it's one of those kind of acquired tastes and depends on what it's with. But uh, I mean, you know, I mean, Felidia, where I used to work, it was an Italian place and people ordered it. So, hey. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Huh. yeah. Okay. So I'm seeing here when they get to the spirits, that's per glass. They're not giving you an entire bottle for. Like no. Aberfeldy for twenty two. Okay, so it's even per glass. A Dalmore thirty five years thirty five years old is six hundred and fifty. I've never heard of Dalmore, but it's not like I really got too into different kinds of alcohols and stuff. But yeah, it's so they have yeah they have rums, they have international whiskeys, other like ryes and bourbons and all kinds of stuff. So if you're if you're it's going to a place is this now is this another type of thing where are there any Top level kind of Michelin tar restaurants that you don't really get into that much alcohol. It's like, oh, it's not, it's not what we do. That's a good question. As far as I know, no. But I mean, I don't know if, if somebody knows otherwise. I mean, feel free to mention. But I mean, I always think of. I mean, per se has an extensive wine list. Le Burner Den. I mean, as far as I know, they all have extensive lists. But again, I'm willing to hear otherwise. Oh. Okay. And um, as Stephen mentioned, there is one last thing on the website we're talking about the content of the place is the Caruther chocolate and it's a little chocolate shop. And this is something that we've talked about 
other series where we're thinking now as part of why this doesn't happen is certain regulations and things and limitations with the state which mutates every industry it enters into and touches and products that they're doing that they prepare for their meals and things like that but the, the process of licensing and it is a cost benefit analysis doesn't become worthwhile like they say okay certain foods must be prepared in this special kind of kitchen this special kind of conditions with these special kinds of ingredients that don't necessarily cross over to stuff that you can just put on a table or put on a plate and things like that so there's issues that go between that that's why a lot of these restaurants end up throwing away perfectly good food instead of giving it to somebody else or pa repackaging it and selling it in a certain way these are things that happen but with Caruther Chocolate, he's happened to ha have this situation where he can sell different chocolates. And we've talked about different restaurants, hopefully getting to this point. Now people are more open to getting things delivered from restaurants that they're normally more tied to actually going to the location. Maybe now restaurants have also invested into getting in touch with people who deliver and get into that system of requiring things in different ways, working remotely. So I think that could that will probably open up a brand new industry of people entering that field, like you see HelloFresh and these kind of, kind of people who have the system where you can actually, where they bring you all the pre-cut kind of foods and the ingredients and you put them together, cook them together at, at your home. So it's something like this. So can you tell us a bit about the Caruso chocolate, if you know about it? Was that something that he started before this this restaurant? Was it something after? Is it made on site? Is it completely separate? Tell us a bit about it that you know. So I'm I'm not super familiar with it. I think it's I'm pretty sure it started after he opened because I think I remember hearing about the restaurant opening. I was talking to my old boss who used to work for him about it, and then I saw sometime later Gabriel Croyther Chocolate is now open. Please, you know, order for our your special events. They also sell macarons, the French cookies, which I really like, and other things there too. So I'm thinking in the future maybe ordering stuff. I would I would think that the chocolates you get served in the restaurant are from there, but I mean I haven't verified that. That would just make sense in terms of efficiency. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, too, is I highly recommend you follow his Instagram page because he also posts a lot of recipes and things that he does that okay. you can make at home. So, for example, there was actually a um, around I think it was Mother's Day. There was actually a Gewürztraminer mousse. So Gewürztraminer, for those who don't know, that's a wine that's big in Alsace where he's from. And what you do is you can actually you separate egg yolks and whites and then you whip up the whites and then like I'm trying to remember the yolks like you fold it back in or something and you can make this mousse that you can like dip fruit into and stuff and it looks it looks really good and it's fairly simple so there, there's things like that and uh, Gewürztraminer is a fruitier one it has like mango and like rose overtones so like that pairs really well and then you like whip eggs and stuff into it and then it becomes like this light refreshing mousse so he posts things like that which you can make at home which I think like aren't super hard to make but I mean you know I mean I, I love the stuff he posts I mean obviously as we get into the dishes, you'll see some of these are definitely would be harder to attempt at home. But some of the stuff he posts on his own, but some of the stuff he posts on his own page, I think is pretty reasonable. I mean, I think he's doing that because he wants to put out dishes that you can make yourself that aren't too intimidating. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a good thing. I will definitely go check that out. We shall have links somewhere, wherever you listen to this, to the blog, where uh, you'll be able to find some of these links to the different places that we're looking at and talking about. So I think now... Um, We've talked about that yeah so there's no classes but we did the cookbook is there but yeah the classes are there the classes are digital you can look at the stuff and see the stuff that he's making so that's some level of classes and i, I imagine definitely if you go to a restaurant that you like and enjoy just inquire chances are you'll find some people who are involved with it having some other presence even even in developed countries people still kind of sleep on the whole aspect of using the internet outside of just like salacious content <laughs> or social media and tweet but there's other things you can do to research and find information and things like this and many of these people will find will have some some other outlet using using some other way to get information about the things that you enjoy out there and series like this where you can go in and talk about things in, in further depth and maybe eventually you can be on, on part of the series so um if, if you're ready um ready to get into the yep. actual food right yep let's okay. jump right in yeah. so as mentioned we normally just uh, talk about the food. We'll get our faces off the screen now, and uh, we'll just be focusing on the actual dishes now. And we normally just talk about a bit about the dish. Like Stephen sent me a document with dishes and things like this. I follow him on social media as well, so I've seen some of the things already. But if we, we, we get the image up, I say the name of it. It's not going to be as brutal this time as it was in the last time of season now. We're <laughs> talking about the Austrian and German kind of language. So I should be doing a lot better in the names right now. I did find out that apparently I was fluent in French when I was like five years old, and I forgot it when <laughs> I went to Kenya to, I had to learn Swahili. But anyway, so I should, I should, it should inspire me from my, from my birthplace. <laughs> some of these names back out there but we talk about the food and i mentioned the name of the food and then we just go back and forth talking about the details of the food and sometimes you branch off into some related bit off the path but still 
seeing where the path is. Sometimes we get to a little too far and come back in. But uh, yeah, it's it's enjoyable. And um, hopefully, if you've been following the series, welcome back for this one. And if, if this is your first one, welcome for the first one and hope you enjoy. So uh, the first one here, we're going to go with an Amuse Bouche, which is a grapefruit mezcal paloma pat. No, is this pet? Is it, there's no, there's no uh, accent. No, it's, it's just it's just pot. Pot. Okay. It's pot de fruit. So, yeah. Um, a grapefruit mezcal, a paloma pot de fruit with yuzu gel. And that's that's mixing a few things. Do they use it like kind of like, is that, is that, isn't that like uh, Japanese and yeah. the mezcal? So, isn't that like uh, more like South American or Mexican? So it's a good mix in here. It's a kind of like, yeah. a, you said we don't like the word fusion, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's inspired by several places. So, so it's interesting you should say that because Andrea, when she tried this, she thought it was really cool because just like the depth of flavors this had. So, um, so grapefruit, you know, mezcal is a uh, it's a smoked tequila. It's from um, from Mexico. They actually they roast the cactus, so it has a smokier flavor. I used to drink quite a bit of mezcal. I have it in some time now. Paloma is actually a type of cocktail which is made with tequila and fruit usually, so it was sort of inspired by that. And then a pot de fruit is basically a, a fruit puree uh, thickened with pectin. Pectin is the um, it's it's the it's kind of a, like it's it usually comes in a powder form. It basically it's what makes jams and jellies like almost like like a gelatinous. Like it's it's like it's a starch that naturally occurs in fruit that when you mix it in with jellies and jams, it makes them thick and almost like you know gelatinous. So that's what a pat de fruit is. It's a fruit puree mixed with pectin. So it's the grapefruit mezcal mixed mixed with um, pectin, presumably to make it uh, solid like that. Now the yuzu gel, yes, yuzu is a. It's been called the Japanese lemon. Um, it looks like a lemon to me. It actually has a slight evergreen flavor to it, which is kind of interesting. If we do a video on Netta, we'll probably talk more about it because that's very big in Japanese cooking. In the U.S., you can buy it fresh in, in Chinatown, but it's typically sold either as juice, uh, frozen, dried, or zest because it doesn't grow here. And then um, that it's made into a gel, which is piped out in the form of it looks like a little foam on the side here. And then espelette pepper is a uh, pepper. It's called uh, in France. It's Piment d'Espelette. It's from the south near the Pyrenees Mountains. Um, it's big in uh, French cooking, but also Basque cooking. So when we talked about uh, Huertas, um, they use a lot of espelette as well. So it's from France, but it's big in that like that general vicinity because it's just it's a it's it's a specific pepper that's cultivated in that area. All right, thoughts, comments? Okay, interesting. So you said, what, what was the taste like here? And again, another different thing that you see with, excuse us, we had some issues with uh, recording this one, so a lot of freezes. But here, I was starting to fanboy over the dishes, and that continues throughout this entire series. So I was asking about the choices of the actual dishes being used at restaurants of this caliber. So back into it. Going on at a restaurant of this of this caliber. Um, yeah, was it? It was it was it was interesting because it tastes like pretty much like all this stuff here. Like you get like, you know, you get the grapefruit. It's like it's sweet, slightly bitter. You get the smokiness of the mezcal. You get the yuzu. So you get like lemon, but there's a little bit of that evergreen element. Then the espelette pepper adds some spice to it. So there's like like because remember, amuse bouche means amusement for the mouth. So the idea is it's to wake up the palate. So it's a lot of strong flavors in a small bite. You know? Yeah, yeah. And these ones, you take an entire piece and you just take yeah. the entire thing into your mouth at once. Yeah, yeah. It's and maybe, yeah, the, maybe, the, the mouth feels. It's, it's maybe like because what it is is each person gets one, and it's maybe like an inch cubed or something. Like it's not huge, but the idea is you get that like that strong flavor to sort of wake up the palate. Yeah. And temperature wise. Oh no, it's uh this is cool because you figure when they make it, it's usually heated up the fruit and um packed in, but then when it cools down, it solidifies. So this is on the cooler side. Yeah. Yeah, I, I for one, am, am a fan of adding peppers and like salads and yeah. things like that. I even put it in some. If I'm doing like a simple fruit salad, like let's say I'm just doing like a bananas with um, but like one of the typical simple fruit salads I do is just I put some bananas and some avocado in the fridge so it gets a bit cooler, and then I cut those up into like little cubes, and then I put um some ginger powder in there or say grated ginger. And just add some like you can add some bullet peppers, some chopped fine peppers into it. Just add a little kick into that and just. I just like that kind of thing together, or just any any salad that you can think of, any just leafy green salad. Throw some peppers in there. It's it's peppers, 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 peppers of all sorts mm -hmm. at all, all times. It's a good thing. We had, we talked about a different. We talked about the Scoville scale and things like that. So you're not going to go in with the super high peppers that are going to completely blast away the taste of whatever it is you're eating. But yeah. just get one of those ones on the lower level, the Scoville scale, and you can add just a bit of extra flavor and, and taste to to the experience of eating different sorts of things. So yeah, that's that's cool. 
And this yeah, is the pe 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 pepper here is just supposed to elevate the flavor slightly and give a little bit of a kick. It's not supposed to be like biting into a spicy meal. You know? mm -hmm. And so what's this dish it's served on? It's like a, it looks like a granite. This is almost like a granite chip. It's like a small thin yeah. plate of granite. Yeah, it's just, huh. it's just a, yeah, slab. Yeah. And, okay, the mise bushes, I always forget this. Do the, you have to pay for the mise bushes, or these are kind of no. things like breadsticks when they count on, if you're at, like, an olive garden? No, they're, they're automatic every time. Like I said, um, when they take your order, they'll ask if you have allergies. So, like, let's say a person, or restrictions, like, let's say I didn't have alcohol, not true, obviously, but, like, they wouldn't send me this because there's mezcal in it. Um, you know, if I had some, like, citrus allergy, they would send something else. Or, like, what they, what they might do in that case is, like, maybe Andrea would have gotten that, then I would get something else that they'd make on the fly. So it's like, it doesn't interfere with my allergies, hypothetically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so every every day they normally have like four or five different amuse bushes that, that they have on that day, depending on, and then you, they match it to, um, yeah, I guess they, they'll probably have a, a to-go one. If nobody has any issues, this will be the main one or two things that they all give out to amuse bush. And then they'll yeah. have two or three background ones, like one that doesn't have alcohol, one that doesn't have dairy or something like that, just yeah. to kind of count them. There's going to be some people who are not going to be able to have anything on the menu, unfortunately, due to their own issues. But then at that point, but you said at that point, sometimes they might be able to try to throw something together with just the ingredients that they have in the back, right? Yeah. Like, um, like I remember doing that at, um, at seasonal, like, for example, like we didn't cover it. I didn't have good photos, but there was an octopus amused bouche, but it was like a baby octopus and it was like little tentacles. <laughs> but the thing is, but the thing is, what would happen was like, let's say a vegetarian came in. OK, maybe they'd saute some vegetables and like do like a little bit of like a vegetable foam or something on the plate, like just so they have something. But like it's it's okay. it's going to be something that they just come up with on the fly. Yeah. Yeah. And with, with these type of restaurants, mm. every section of the dish, every part of the dish will be served together. Now, this is interesting. What happened here, since you had the the, the three part, the, you had the three dish tasting dish and she had the four. So what do they do off of that fourth one that's kind of off? So what they do, I'll, I'll get to the extra course she got, but basically what they did was they just brought out her course, but then they gave me a share plate in case I wanted to try any, which, you know, I had a little bit of. So they'll do things okay. like that. Um, and then it, it just, it's just expected then like, so it's like, the two app, it's like, I'll have my appetizer. She has hers. She has the second appetizer, you know, and then I get the share plate. We both have entrees. We both have dessert. So that's how, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, hey, that was that was one thing that you did say when we were looking over before. There was this four different sections. So they let you pick which are the four different, they let you pick which three sections you want something from. Yeah. Or, yeah. okay. So, and how many different sections was it? You said it was, was it five or four? I'm forgetting what it was on the menu. There were four sections, but what, where, where I wasn't sure was could I pick from because there's there's like there's like one appetizer category, another appetizer category, entrees, desserts. And what I wasn't sure was could I pick an app from either category? And they said yes. But then if you get the four, okay. you would pick one from the first one from the second. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. All right. There we go. So anything else on that one? Uh, no, no, it was really good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now on to the next amuse bouche. Yeah. And here we have um, yellow tomato gazpacho with basil oil. Yep. This kind of reminds me a bit of the, it's kind of that egg type of thing where, or what was it? Uh, um, Casamona with the olive oil. The ice, on the, the ice on cream the with the olive oil. Yeah. 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 So, huh. so this came, this came out as the same time as the Pat de Fouille, like um, also the next uh, bread, which I'll, we'll go over next. Um, this all came out at the same time. So this is just another amuse bouche gazpacho. For those who don't know, it's a cold Mexican soup, usually based off tomatoes, peppers, um, usually some onion. People do different takes on this. I mean, some people, I've had one made with watermelon. That's pretty good. Um, that, you know, some people will add uh, a little bit of lemon juice. Like you can do different things. So this was yellow tomatoes. And um, by the flavor, there was probably like maybe a touch of uh maybe like a touch of vinegar just to sort of brighten it up a little so it's a little stronger i mean it doesn't taste like vinegar but you get my point and then the basil oil on top it's more for decoration i mean it has flavor too but you know you're not going to eat straight oil it's usually more to add a little bit of flavor in the decoration this you can probably <laughs> tell well this you can tell it's just you know you drink it in one shot i mean just you know another thing to wake up the palate yeah and this is one thing that uh, i mean but but we know that sometimes i say ignorantly Sometimes you do. It, it, it happens sometimes, and there's certain things that people just say to say because it's, it seems that people think people have been. So, here I was just talking about how when you see certain food at this restaurant, this is a mix of different kind of ways of cooking, different cultures, and things like this. But why do people seem to think that, oh, we need X person from X country to be in our country so they can cook us X food from X country when you can just cook it yourself?
to your country and then make food for you? Like, is that all they're good for? Is that like the best thing that you can think of? And also in this situation, I'm thinking of myself, like, do you think, am I supposed to only cook Kenyan food because I'm a Kenyan citizen? Mm. Or am I allowed to cook French food because I was born in France? Now I've lived in America, so am I allowed to cook all three of those together? Or do I have to keep them separate depending on where I am and who I'm cooking for? This whole idea that, oh, if somebody, if something's a French restaurant, someone's a French chef, they have to do everything just 100% from the history of French, of the French is, is absurd because as we've talked about in previous, uh, in other series of the You Are What You Consume, how does something come from being just a food that's eaten in a certain region to be called like now that we have a nation called France within these borders, we're going to do that. Because you go back in the history and some of those people that inspired the French dishes now were from the areas that are now called Germany. Some of the people from Germany had traveled to the new world and gotten some spices from there and then they brought it back and added to it. And then that's the dish that was now inspired by somebody who was visiting, who was like an ambassador in, in, in Germany and then they moved back to France. And then now you're saying, oh, this is a French dish. Like, no, the ingredients came from Asia. The means of cooking it came from Germany. And then <laughs> now it's actually in France. And then now you're seeing this thing right now with this globalization that we have, with this information sharing, where you have these magnificent mixes of things coming from different places, techniques and ingredients and things, because we're all human beings and we're all able to ingest most of these things outside of our allergies. But it's it's really good to see this. And I'm, I, I like seeing this. And I do know there are some, probably some restaurants that are a lot more strict on saying, we're only cooking from this one place in this one kind of style, and that's kind of what they sell on. But I, I like seeing this this mix of different styles and, and inspirations. I actually have a funny story sort of based on what you just said, where um, Rose was posting uh, a breakfast she made for her mother, and she's at Georgian breakfast, and Ray commented saying, I thought you were Russian. She's like, yeah, I am. <laughs> she's, like, yeah, she's, like, she's like, yeah, I am, but Russian food is terrible. You'll never see me posting a Russian breakfast. And then, and then someone, she's like, like she's like, why do people assume automatically that I'm only going to make food from the country that I'm from or something like that? Yeah. It's like she's it's, just like she's like food. I've had I've had Russian breakfast food. I don't like it. That's why I make other stuff. <laughs> well, what's wrong with cabbage uh, well, soup Ray, for breakfast? And then Ray was saying she's like I'm Scandinavian. She's like I don't like a lot of that food either. I'm like yeah, because it's like pickled stuff, dill, <laughs> eggs, cream. I'm like yeah, so I was like you know, it's like nothing says you have to eat, adhere to this. It was just I thought it was a funny uh, exchange. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there, there definitely is an aspect where they've gone to that diet where they say the the, the, the primal diets is a prehistoric diet, things like that. And there definitely are things where some people from certain regions, doing, due to being selective and eating certain foods, they'll have a less of a reaction or more positive reaction to certain foods. And some people are just entirely allergic to certain kinds of chemical com combinations from when foods take proteins, take whatever it is out of the elements, out of minerals and all these things out of the air and combine them together to make the proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Certain combina combinations due to where we've lived are not going to necessarily affect us in the same way. That one, I'm not denying that simple, sci like simple scientific biology aspect of evolution in that aspect. But when it comes to tasting, when it comes to techniques, there's many times where I'm like, I like goat, but then I take something from a place that has never had a goat and then prepare a goat in that. Like putting goat on pizza. No place that initially had pizza really had goats that much. There might be some mountain goats out there. It wasn't a typical thing to have out there. There's many great Indian dishes and Indian styles. Now, for many of them, it's cows are, are considered are considered uh, holy and they're not necessarily eaten. So you just use some beef, some nice cuts of beef in there and that same kind of style. And you still have that kind of thing. There's certain foods where it's like, oh, it's only land animals. Switch it out with fish, switch it out with seafood. It's, it's been, there's many good things to do out there. Don't limit yourself when we have all this information on this small little tiny planet or this spaceship that we're on. Don't limit yourself to something based off of something completely arbitrary due to your place of birth. Yeah. Uh, so, th th yeah, those are some of the rants that we go on, <laughs> not necessarily about food, but I think it is food related somehow. So um, anything else you have to say about the gazpacho? When's the first time you had no. gazpacho? Gazpacho. That's a good question, actually. I'm trying to remember. I think I might have made it in the vocational culinary uh, program I was in in high school because I, I hadn't heard of it. I think it was something we made one day. And then I've worked in a few places that have served it, like Barbalu. Like I said, they did one with watermelon, which I thought was kind of nice, especially nice on a hot day. Um, yeah, it's, it's really nice and refreshing on a hot day. Um, again, the challenge I mentioned in a previous discussion, the challenge with these cold soups so on the hot days, you have to keep them cold except when you serve them because going in and out with the te time temperature abuse, it gets kind of bad. So that was kind of a pain. But I mean, you know, you do what you have to. Um, um, it's not something I typically get, but I thought this was kind of cool. So, and how with these higher level restaurants, how apprehensive are they to using food coloring to get certain? Uh, 
I would I would say they probably don't at all, except for um, except for like naturally occurring stuff. So like with this, they just use yellow tomatoes to make it, so it's yellow. They didn't add anything. Um, and then like you know like you'll see these oils and things, but the oils you actually make with the herb itself. So it's taking on the chlorophyll from the herb as well as the flavor. It's not like they're not putting green dye in the oil. Uh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's one thing that um, with some of these things. It's kind of like to save up for the time when you actually have it. Trying to get lower similar outcomes of certain things, it's going to do a disservice to you and the actual thing that you're having. That's my suggestion. But for some people, they they're okay with other levels of things. Like, like for me, like something for this is basic thing. It's not really the top highest level of of food ever. But something like Oreos, I don't like imitation Oreos. Like if if I'm going to have a chocolate like a chocolate sandwich cooking and there's no Oreos, I'll probably not have them. I'll just wait till I can actually get the actual Oreos. So that's a, yeah. something to kind of compare where it's like, if something is it, it's it. <laughs> like it's, mm-hmm. it's the X. Yeah. Okay, so the next one. Yep. We have, um, okay, here's a name. Throw in his name. There's a little twister in here. So uh, uh, Kogel, Kogelopf. Kogelopf. Yep. Kogelopf, yeah. Chive Kogelopf with ch- chive uh, fromage blanc. Okay. Blanc. So th- this is interesting. This is almost like, and you remember in the last discussion we talked about palate chinkin, which are basically crepes. It's ca- it, it kind of reminds me of this in the sense yeah. that this is one of these dishes that a lot of like every every region kind of has, has their own version of this. Like it's based in you can probably tell by the shape. It's made in a bunt uh, cake mold. That's how it takes the shape. It can be sweet or savory. Um, you know this this particular spelling is the Alsatian spelling because in German it would be. Um, it would be K U G E L, or there's also I've seen Google Hops G U G E L, but with the U, with the O, oh, that's the French, that's the Alsatian spelling, and it's not they're not 100 percent where sure where it came from. I mean, it's it's in southern Germany, it's in Austria, it's in Switzerland, uh, Hungary, um, you know, of course Alsace, a lot of German influence. Um, so I've typically I've typically seen it as a dessert, but this is a savory version. So there's um, you know, it's obviously more of a savory taste. There's actually uh, there's actually chives um, in the bread itself, and then the fromage yeah, blanc. Good. Yeah, and then and then the fromage blanc is um, it's a fresh cheese. It's from the north of France, south of Belgium. Uh, means literally white cheese in um, in France. Um, it's a softer cheese. Um, it's usually uh, whole milk. It's sort of comparable to quark, which is like a type, which is like yogurt. It's like similar to that. I'm not sure 100 percent how they made this fromage blanc here. If like because it, it's colored with the green, but there's no like physical chives in it. So my guess is that what they might have done is they might have like blended. They might have blended the fromage blanc with uh, chives and then strained it out, or they may have made like a chive oil and added that. That's another possibility because it tastes like chives, but again, it's it's green and it's a, it's a greenish color and it's smooth, but there's no actual chive pieces in there. Yeah, yeah likely the oil because you're not going to get too many yeah. cheeses that are this creamy, right? Because even if you get like no, this no. really soft breeze, or I guess it's like gorgonzola if you get the really fresh gorgonzola, it's yeah. free. And then yeah, you can say the mozzarella burrata, you the interior, but the burrata yeah. interior is actually cream. It's not really cheese. And we, yeah, when does something switch over from being cheese to a cream to like a milk? Like, what's the technical switch over for some of these things? I think it has to do with the fat content and like how thick it is. So it's like if you were to do like skim milk for like you could make something with skim milk, but it's going to be a lot like it's going to be kind of watery. Whereas if you do whole milk, it's going to be creamier and then the cream and the fat will separate. So you have to whisk it back together. Um, I know the French, they have something uh, fromage frais, which means fresh cheese. Like that's like the word fresh versus uh, fromage mm-hmm. blanc, which is white cheese. Those vary slightly. So there's like there's little things like that. Like I don't know off the top of my head what the differences are, but I think it's like fat content, like how long it's aged, like, um, things like that. Yeah. yeah, like many even of the hard, harder cheeses like the Parmesan is – if you yeah. actually have it early in this process, it would be a lot softer, right? But they, yeah. they, they leave it to dry and age and, and get more get more body to it, right? Yeah, well, like maybe, um, maybe we can talk to our friend Kyra about this. But if you have like the Dutch Goudas, like the ones that are five years old, they get um, they get they actually get really sweet and like they get almost like a caramel kind of element. But the ones that like the cheaper ones you buy at the store, maybe like one year aged or like even like a few months aged. But like the ones that are like five years or more get really sweet and crumbly. But you have to age it for longer for it to get to that. So things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, this one looks like something you could make once you figure out how to make the the cream. You can use like a cream cheese and flavor it in different ways and just get a little, this little tiny guy bunt cake little thing for this one. But it seems like something you can make. And of course, you cannot play around with different flavors. The chives, you can switch up many different kind of herbs. Mm. And also, we were talking about the difference between uh, when you're scrolling between um, cream, milk, and, and cheese. What's the difference between bread and cake, if you know? 
Um, so it, it has to do, I know it has to do with the uh, fat content density because they've talked about with brioche, how brioche is actually close to being a cake because it's very high in fat. Like there's a lot of, there's eggs, there's butter. Uh, some people use milk, some people use water depending, but apparently there's a certain there's a certain amount where it becomes dense enough. It gets classified as a cake, whereas brioche, like, because it still rises a bit, it's still a bread, but, like, it's heading in that direction. I don't know exactly what the crossover is in that, but I think it's that plus also the shape it's made in. Because I was just thinking, even with this uh, this thing here, is, again, Google Huff, you can do sweet or savory, but the other thing you could do here is make, use one of the big molds. Like, I know my mother at her, her house has a big uh, mold. You could do even, like, a big serving of it and then just cut that into, like, 10, 15 pieces yeah. and just serve that to a group. You could do that, too, you know. Yeah. But th this is this is that's, meant that's for like two. Point. But th but this is meant for like two to four people to share, so each person grabs like you know small pieces. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and that's the start. You said they all came together, so it's normally when you go and you get this, it's not. Oh, well, you said this was a tasting man. No, this is not the taste. This is a muse bouche. So when you go, you can normally expect three to like about three muse bouches, or is it two to three? Like what decides that? So it depends on the place. At seasonal, you just got one, but at seasonal, they also offered you bread with spread. Um, with this, it's like it's just the two amuse bouche and bread automatically. Um, I'm not sure if places have like a certain formula or what. I think it just depends on what they feel like doing. Okay. Because you think with some okay. of these places too, if you're going to get multiple courses, they don't they don't want you to fill up on bread. So they'll give you they'll give you some to try it, but it's like you're not like you're not going to keep ordering more bread. Like you go to a casual place, you can keep ordering more bread, but like. You know, they, they don't want you to do that here. I mean, I think if you were to get more um, in the, with this place, like you notice Kugelhoff is on the uh, a la carte menu, like eight dollars a serving. So if you wanted more, you would have to pay for it. But I think that's deliberate because, you know, you can or they send you one automatically. If you want more, you have to pay for it. But like, I think they'd rather you order other food. That's the thing. Yeah. And I guess also in this situation, you're already down for the taste. By this time, you've told them you get to the tasting menu. right? I mean, you yeah. Yeah, because 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 you order you order your courses three, three or four dishes. So adding these are not going to go ahead. So I'm yeah. saying like adding this, like giving you three of these is going to it's not going to really lose them any money because you're still going to you still already yeah. ordered the the three or four yeah. dishes that you have. Yeah. So they might as well give you this to add to the experience of you being there. Whereas if you're going and you probably order like one or two things, I I doubt they would give you the three for for that kind of situation. Yeah, like it's like like I say. <laughs> But, but but like I say, it's like you can't wave them over and be like, "Hey, more bread," and it's like a casual yeah. place. We'll send it to you. <laughs> yeah. But like, but but that but the idea is that they want you to order the other stuff. But again, if if you wanted to order like five of these, you could. But it's like, what's the point? You know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now we're going to jump into the actual dishes and yeah. <laughs> starting off with the with a good one. This is the, what we had talked about before with Stephen. We're looking at the at the uh, foie gras terrine, and we're like, oh, that looks amazing, the plating and things. And then we see, then it was like, oh, there's a free free. And then we went there and we saw this and it was like, oh man. Stephen so was like, yes, uh, I'm <laughs> most uh -huh. definitely. And that is the seared foie gras with roasted peaches, roasted peach puree, um, the Wurztraminer. Yep. And then, sorry, Ger Wurztraminer Julie uh, with cocoa Gelee. crumble. Julie with cocoa crumble, whiskey gastrique. Mm -hmm. And uh, sautéed scallions. That's sure. a, that cake looks like some kind of oyster shell. It's amazing. Dude. It's, it's, it's yeah, good. yeah. This, like we were saying, uh, I was debating on this or the cold one. Both looked awesome. I mean, the cold one just looks very bright with the colors and everything. Both are both have a lot of uh, Alsatian influence. So I'll get into this here. Uh, seared foie gras. I mean, I, I'm sure if you're watching this, you know what foie gras is already. <laughs> roast peach. Roast peach is the uh, the peaches are so, slightly seared, so they're caramelized. It's kind of nice, you know, accentuate the sugar. Um, and then what they did was they used to actually have peach jam on the plate, but what they're doing now is they're actually roasting, using some of the roasted peaches and making a puree out of that. So the flavors are a bit more concentrated. Um, Gewürztraminer, I, I touched on this briefly before. So that's a wine originally, it's interesting. It's actually originally from Italy, from the, uh, from Tremino. So in German, Gewürztraminer means uh, spiced or perfumed Tremino. The idea is because it has like a more potent sort of like, it, like it smells almost like spices, mango or uh, rose overtones. So like it's like spice or perfume Tremino. That's where the name comes from. So what he did was he took the wine, then he mixed that presumably with um, with gelatin or agar agar or something. So you could make little uh, like little um, it, it would sort of solidify almost like jello. And then you would cut those into pieces and put them on the plate. Um, the cocoa crumble is on the foie itself and that the, the cocoa, uh, is seared. The cocoa is a combination of cocoa nibs, but there's also some kind of, um, 
there's something sort of crumbly, almost like pastry-like in there. I'm not sure exactly what it was. Um, Try to think of what I would compare it to, like... <sighs> Like there's certain donuts you can get with this on it. I don't know exactly. Like they have like kind of a crunchy exterior. I'm not sure. It's like it's not it's not streusel crust exactly, but it's something like it's a crumbly, crunchy thing. Uh, so with cocoa nibs and then that's that's seared and then the foie is cooked in the middle. Um, whiskey gastrique. So for those who don't know, uh, gastrique it's it's like an old school uh, it's an it's an old school French thing, but it's kind of like confit or something where it's one of those things that. Um, it's one of those terms that kind of gets thrown around contemporarily. It's so it's caramelized sugar and it's usually deglazed with uh, vinegar or some kind of other um, either vinegar or liquor or something. So what it is, it's probably caramelized sugar. They probably finish it with whiskey and then they like, you know, swoosh that around the plate and then some sauteed scallions. The scallions are sauteed lightly to sort of take a little bit of the edge away. So they're not caramelized, but they're like a little softer. So that's just sort of to contrast some of the sweetness. So, yeah. Really, really excellent dish. And then I had this wine here. This is a. Uh, I figured mm. I'd include the wine. I figured I'd include the wines in here because you know it's not as big of a presentation. So this is a. Um, this is a Chardonnay. It's from Chassagne Montrachet. It had sort of an oaky element. So oak, if, for those who don't know, in part sort of like a vanilla or um, caramel element to the flavor. So that sort of went well with the foie. And uh, the wine was excellent, of course. All right. Thoughts, comments. Okay. Yeah. Um... Now with this, the cocoa nibs on it. Yeah, because a lot of people, there's probably a lot of people who've had chocolate who don't know what actual, but it comes from a bean. Uh, but I guess uh, maybe most people have, but yeah, there'll be, I put that on the screen. If you've been watching, you see the cocoa nibs on there. But with, with the foie, like, have you had a foie like this before topped with something crunch? We've seen many different foies with normally like a cream or something more softer onto it. So here with like the, the, the soft creaminess and then the, the crunchiness of it. And you said this was a warmer dish. It's not like hot, but it's warmer than, it's because it's seared. So the, the outside is seared, but is it something where they prepare the foie ahead of time and then they keep it maybe in a fridge or, or sitting and then they take it out and then lightly sear it. And then uh, I guess with no, this no, one... No. No, no. Usually, what you do with foie gras is you would you would cut you would portion it in advance because the way it is with foie gras, if you ever if you've ever worked with a foie gras lobe, there's a lot of veins running through it, and if you're doing a cold preparation, you have to actually like pull the um, the foie off the veins itself. But the thing is with hot foie gras, you just cut it into pieces and cook it. Then when you cook it, the veins break down, so it's not a big deal. So what usually what they would do here is they would portion this in advance and then um, maybe put the cocoa nibs on it and then like have them lined up in a tray or something. And then when it comes time to, to um, pick up an order, what they probably do is they heat up the puree, they heat up the peaches, put send it all up to the pass, and then the chef plates this, and then the foie just gets put on the plate last minute. So there's probably... Uh, the entremet probably picks up the uh, scallions here, probably picks up the peaches. The sauces are probably in um, pots up at the pass. Occasionally they're heated up if need be. And then the meat the meat guy or woman will saute the foie, and then they all pass it up together and plate it. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. – And how many people do you think are working in the kitchen here? Oh, I have no idea. I mean I'm sure, I'm sure if it's a French brigade system, it's probably a bigger crew. Um I don't I don't think it would be like Danielle. Danielle, if you remember, it was like 17, 18 people on the line and like 60 prep cooks. I don't think it's anywhere close to that, but I'm sure they probably have like I would imagine probably around at least, you know, eight to 10 people in the kitchen. I mean, if anyone's worked here, I'm curious to know, but I would imagine they probably have a bigger crew like 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 seasonal. Remember, seasonal only had a chef de cuisine, sous chef meat cook, entremet, and then garde manger pastry was one. So that's five people. But here it's probably at least 10 or so. I would I would estimate. I don't know. I'm not sure if they have prep cooks who come in and do this too, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And with this one, it's it's the first time being there, so I don't know. But is this something where you think they have – I guess, I don't know, I'm just asking the question. But do they switch these around like where they might switch out to the apricots or other kind of fruits depending on the season? Is it something that you think would be on the menu for some time? Or do you think this is something that's uniquely towards the peach and towards this? Or are the ingredients things that actually can technically be found? Because I guess the peaches you can find most of the time. That seems to be the only thing that you'd really need to switch out to, due to the – season but then we could roast some other fruit that is like a peach and you can also make a puree of some other fruit that's like the peach and everything else seems to be like something you can get around the year without it being out of season technically yeah because remember she and i ate here it was technically before the first day of fall so it was like this is like sort of the tail end of the summer menu so my guess is he'll probably replace the peaches with like pumpkin or squash or something next what's interesting though is that a lot of places don't serve hot foie gras during the warmer weather because it's you know it's 
some people think it's too ranchy. You know, you know me, I can eat it all year, but it's like some people <laughs> won't do that. But like what, what, what other places I've worked at, what they'll actually do is they'll serve um They'll serve cold foie gras when the weather is hot, and then hot foie gras when it's warm, when it's uh, cool out. Um, it looks like here they serve both. I don't know if they serve both all year. I'm not 100 percent sure. I mean, maybe he does that. I'm not. I would have to like go back and check. But like I noticed, um, like at Mineta Tavern, they have a foie gras terrine that they serve all year around, but that's cold. But then in like now they started running a chicken dish that has hot foie in it. So it's like because it's colder out, they're starting to serve like warmer, richer stuff. Whereas in the summer, it's like Foie is a fatty thing, but it's cooler, so it's not supposed to be as much. And the, the piece you have isn't huge either. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and um, what was we, we saw this? This was this was now this isn't on the regular menu. As we saw, this one was only on the pre-free menu. So there's going to be some prefix. There's going to be some things where you only get them prefix. Some things you have on the actual regular menu. So we didn't see the actual individual price for this one uh, by itself. If you actually check the uh, prefix menu, it is on here, but it's not on the a la carte. Um, but the thing is, but again, this goes to what I was saying about they try to get you to get the prefix. So like they offer you some more things with this. There's actually a ten dollar upcharge. I mean, I don't mind paying it, but you you typically see an upcharge with things like, you know, foie gras, caviar, truffles. There's usually an upcharge. Typical with tr typically with truffles, it's sold by like the gram. Same thing with caviar. With foie gras, it'll be like 10 or 15 bucks. Like here, here's the price. Like let's so for me, it'd be 135. But then you get the foie. That's an additional 10 bucks. So, um, and then they also have, uh, there's a supplemental charge. They have a uh, citrus marinated langoustine and bison tartare. That looks good too. I didn't get wow. that, of course, but, but, but that, but that's an additional 15 bucks because langoustines are in season a certain time of year. So like things like that, like you can get it, but you have to pay a little more. So you, you know, you decide, do you want to spend a little more money? Yeah. Yeah. And to finish off, uh, I, I've worked with ceramics, really enjoy it, really suggest anybody out there who wants to get into some art and hasn't done anything really visually, physically, art, artistic, with creative wise, try ceramics. It's something enjoyable. Stephen has said he's done that in the past as well. Uh, with this plate, I'm guessing it was ceramics, it was definitely hand thrown. Stuff on the side, yeah, it, it looks almost metallic. It looks a bit like an oyster shell, like I said, like a clam shell. It's just really, yeah. really interesting. Really, yeah. Really cool plating. And I'm, I'm imagining this is probably the only dish that they serve on this plate. I wonder if it's like something they rotate. But yeah, it's, just, it's cool stuff getting these things. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure next season if, if they were, well, I mean, they're probably going to have fo hot foie gras now because it's cold out. But like if like when spring comes and they do something else, like they'd probably just put another dish on this plate. That'd, that'd be my guess anyway. Yeah. Recording this in post as we're having a lot of connection issues while recording this part, but we have Andrea here for this dish, and she will be coming on to discuss the next recording that we're doing on Casa Lula. Back to the conversation, and excuse the editing. And um, this is a smoked heirloom tomato cons consomme. Is it consomme or consomme? Consomme. Um, consomme, yes. We said that before, I keep getting it off. Consomme. And uh, this included crown toro hamachi. Uh, avocado and uh, macerated cucumbers. Yep. All right. So this is uh, Andrea with the dish. This was her first course. This dish was kind of interesting. It's kind of an older school dish. I thought it was kind of cool. She wasn't crazy about it because um, the thing is consomme is a clarified uh, super broth, but this one was actually based off tomatoes. So they, I guess they made, it's kind of like tomato soup, but like it will, it looks like what they did was they might have they might have done tomato water. There's a thing you can do where if you puree tomato and you strain it out a certain way. My guess is that's probably what they did, and they pureed it. They mixed it with gelatin or something, so it would uh, congeal or aspic or something. Aspic is uh, typically used. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. This was kind of an older school dish, so like she wasn't crazy about it. I mean, I thought it was kind of cool, but it was like this is the kind of thing that like I made in culinary school, but not like I don't see it in a lot of places anymore. Um, hamachi, that's uh, yellowtail, that was in there. Avocado, I think you can tell. And then the cucumbers, and then there was also, um, there was a cheese on top. I'm not 100% sure what it was. It was more of like a crumbly thing. Um, again, I get like, this wasn't, this is this was like this is another like very summery dish, but again, we were here at like the tail end of summer, so that's why. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like she, I actually ended up finishing this dish because she only, she wasn't crazy but about it. But I mean, you know, it's like, it definitely is like, it's it's a little more old school. Like it's the kind of thing that if I were to open a restaurant now, I wouldn't run this. But because he's like an older school friend chef, it kind of works. So, yeah. yeah. And with some of these dishes, we also talked about how some things are super old. Some of the things that we've talked about, like the oldest thing uh, we talked about here was capers, which was in actually in Gilgamesh, which is the oldest story that, that humans have that was involved in there. But some other dishes, you actually get into the situation where now they're making these things with the, 
with the things that, that make it congeal and make it like solidify. Like these are things that are processed through some kind of industrial manufacturing process. Yeah. So I was kind of wondering with some of these things, what were they using before they actually had this? And some of them, they just wasn't this kind of dish before. Some of these things are just taking general ideas that were done with things and then somebody comes in and they invent something new and they think, oh, okay, where to add this? And it has come up in these conversations. We're talking about different dishes sometimes as well go into the background of the history and find some stuff like the last one that was rather interesting was um was it like the plum pudding it's actually not really plums it's just called plum yeah. pudding for like some random issue it's like what no it's the lies the lies <laughs> yeah so uh tell us a bit now about the wine you you listened here that she was drinking a certain wine sure i just want to say one more thing on this um a lot of people don't get is that gelatin was originally used for savory applications because you think about it gelatin comes from animal bones so the idea is like <laughs> If you sim, if you when you make stock, when you simmer it down, like it'll actually get thickened from the animal bones. And if you simmer it, if you reduce it further, it'll actually get thick. And then if it if it congeals, it actually becomes like Jello. And I remember in school they were saying that if you make demi glace, that's one of the mother sauces. It's espanol sauce with um, veal sauce. If you reduce it enough, it actually gets so solid you can actually bounce it. Like you can actually like oh, wow. reduce the sauce all the way and throw it. And then I remember I said this in school, and my chef's like, "We're not bouncing any stock in here." <laughs> but it's like, but the thing is, but the ge the gelatin actually gets condensed enough where you can do. That that and the thing is that's the thing but like i think she's weirded out by it because you know if you grow up in the u.s it's like you're used to having gelatin as like a sweet thing so when you have it savory yeah. it seems kind of weird but again that was the original application so you know um and with something like this also i guess that's something to look into if you are a vegetarian or a vegan check with some yeah. of the foods that you have there might be uh some actual meat products when you're using gelatin that's a treatment but they have manufactured non uh non-animal based um for non animal based gelatins and I think like agar agar and some of these yeah. agar agar we think it was from some moss or some kind of fungus or seaweed, like seaweed, seaweed, yeah. seaweed based yeah yeah so there's uh, there's other there's other ones to find so if you're looking to making certain dishes that have certain yeah. aspects that were made mostly meat you can also find yeah. and you can also discover ways to do like vegan versions vegetarian versions of it depending on your diet and your preferences so yeah, now into the the vino Sure. So this is the, it was called the Big Basins. Um, it's a Syrah Grenache blend. For those who don't know, Syrah and Grenache are from the Rhone Valley in France. Um, those are the famous reds from there. This, But this one was from California, but it was those grapes. Uh, she said it was the best red wine she's had. I tried it. I thought it was excellent. I mean, all the wine I had here was great. <clears throat> Sorry. I spent, uh, you know, I spent a little more than I typically would. Like what I paid for a glass here is probably about double what I typically pay. But I mean, the quality was definitely worth it. Like you feel, I feel like this compared to wine I've had at other places, like I got what I paid for. But again, it's like, this is why I wouldn't come here like every week because, you know, it's too much money. <laughs> okay. Now with the Big Basin Syrah Grenache blend, uh, what, did yeah. those, what does that mean? Is that just the location? That, and then the location has a certain taste that's 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 known for the, the type of grapes that grow there. If y'all want more on the, on the wine, I highly suggest also the, you are, you are the I Know Great People series. Mm -hmm. That one isn't posted yet, but I think it will be posted shortly after this is posted. Uh, but it's we talked with a uh, friend, Laura Mounds, and she's a natural wine expert in Canada, and she told us a, lo a lot of interesting things about wine. And Stephen and her might break off and do like a separate like wine special one that comes that you are what you consume series, or just talk about those things over again. So yeah, with this one, does naming the area does that give people who are somewhat in the know about wine? Does that tell them about the the, the temperature of the things or the grapes that were there? What's what's the point of putting those out? So Big Big Basin is actually the name of the winery. Um, <clears throat> okay. I'm not sure why they picked the name, but apparently they're actually known for the Rhone Valley wines. So they're big on Syrah, Grenache. There's another one called Morved. Um, that's what the Rhone Valley in France is known for. But apparently they're producing those, but in California. Um, the winery name sort of changed depending – well – Wineries can either be named off of like certain themes or like certain people who are there or the family names. Like it was funny. There's actually Cake Bread Winery, and I thought that was just a name they thought was cute or something. It turns out that's that's actually <laughs> the family name. Well, because there, there was there was a guy who did an event at Felidia. They're like, oh, Mr. Cake Bread is here. I'm like, oh, that's actually a person. <laughs> like I didn't know, but like I don't, I, but I don't know. I guess like so. Some people again, it's the family names. Other people, it's just like big basin. It's like a big area. It's in the mountains, and like I guess. You know, it's a certain name. Like, it might be a reference to a mountain. It might just be a big area. It's, you know, what I think whatever they feel like doing. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's more essentially a brand where somebody will mention that yeah. and the people who are in the know will know that these people actually make a good product. So it could be a yeah. wide range of different of different uh, grapes being used, but you just know they're up to a certain standard and, and something yeah. you can trust, right? Okay. Yeah, that's why that's why it's in caps, too, because the idea is like, oh, this is a big base and produce wine. So people who know that producer will know. OK, whereas if it were lowercase, it would be made like in a big basin. You know, that's the point. So it's like it's that name brand. Yeah. OK. 
Now, now we're on to the next one here, and we have here now. This is this this one was there also in the the website, so it's something that mm -hmm. that they they themselves put forward as one of the the, the main flagship in, in ident identifier things for the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And this is the sturgeon and sauerkraut tart yep. in Sabayon, yep. uh, applewood smoke, <clears throat> Royal Kaluga calabar. Cav caviar, sorry, yeah. and yeah, this looks interesting with this. Uh, it's that's not a, it's not a wine glass. Is it a wine glass? Yeah, or is so it something we'll, shaped we'll, like a wine glass. We'll, we'll post a video on this. We actually, I took a video of them actually doing this table side, which is really cool. So this is actually this is this recipe is included in the cookbook. By the way, this is a very sort of Alsatian themed dish because sturgeon, you know, the fish. It's um the fish has been smoked. Sauerkraut is on the bottom. Now zabayon, for those who don't know, that's an egg custard. Basically, you um. You whip up egg yolks. It's it's so, like similar to hollandaise, where you whip up the egg yolks and you add things to it, so it gets sort of this, this like frothy texture. Um, Sabayon in Italian, there's something called, I think it's Zabiglione. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but there's like where they actually will add like uh, Marsala wine to make it sweet, and that's a dessert. But this is more of a savory application, and. <laughs> Uh, Kaluga caviar, I think that's self-explanatory, and uh, some chives on top too. And what the way they do the smoke, what you do is there's actually a little, uh, it's called a smoke gun. There's a little um, a device you can get. There's a little chamber with a, um, you can put uh, wood chips in, and then there's a little, uh, it's like a, a tube. And what you do is you actually, you put the chips in, you light the chips on fire, that starts generating smoke, which comes out through the tube. What you do is you'd put it next to the, um, you put it next to the dish that you're trying to smoke, and then like, put the glass mostly covering it, shoot out a bunch of smoke, and then push the glass down so the smoke stays trapped in there. And then you run it out to the table, then you sort of, you explain, and you do this thing, they sort of like spin it over top, and then like, you know, here's the dish, here's what it is, and then you eat it, yeah. Like I worked in a place, they did this with a burger, I've seen it done with um, ribs, it's, it's I mean, it, it does add flavor, but like it's, it's also just part of the presentation, like, oh, people think it's cool, you have this smoked dish that is done table side, yeah. Yeah, because I was thinking, even if it's a very strong uh, wood, and we've we also talk, talked about uh, again in a previous series, we forget yeah. which one it was in specific, where we went to like the different smoking and the different woods and different levels for different kind of meals and things like that. So even, even if you have one of the stronger woods, this short of a time is not really going to impart too much flavor. But you're sitting at the table, so that aroma could be in there. And there is something about uh, taste is a big part of taste is the smell of the actual food that's in there. So. I can imagine it adds some of that in there. Yep. And um, this looks like you said um, you said the bottom was okay. The yeah, that's a, the tart. So that's yeah. The, the bottom looks like a shell. Looks like almost like the, like a, the breading type of thing. What it is? What, is the, what makes that? Part? So what's that? It's, sim that of? it's similar to a pie crust. Uh, it's pretty flaky. Obviously not sweet. It's more savory. It tastes kind of buttery and it like flakes apart if you break it up. Um, and then. The sturgeon is on the bottom. The sturgeon is in between the sabayon and the crust, and then there's some sauerkraut in there too. Yeah. So this is like a wheat-based type of uh, pastry that they'll make in there. Yeah. So typically, um, <clears throat> typically the way you make pie crust, it's three, two, one dough. It's um, what is that? Uh, flour, butter, and water. That's typically all it yeah. is. I mean, obviously you can add, obviously you could add uh, sugar and other things to it, but for this purpose, it's just a savory pastry. Yeah. Okay. And I see they've added some flower petals, uh, this for yeah. good decoration here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Some purple ones and then the orange one in there. And yeah, you eat those. There's a lot of flowers you can actually eat. Like Fiori yep. Zucca is one of the typical ones that people eat, but then there's as many other flowers that can be can be eaten. And I guess they can also switch those around. But yeah, this is now something like this. What's what do you know the region or area that this is inspired from? Like is it something you think he kind of came together more by himself? So I think a little bit of it is his native Alsace, because remember the German influence again. So like sauerkraut would be big in Alsace as well. They actually have a dish, uh, Schokrut. I, I haven't tried that. I want it, though. I think it's like sausage, apples, sauerkraut, and I think there's like one or two other things. Like that's like the Alsace regional dish. You can obviously see the Germanic influence. So sauerkraut, I think he actually makes his own sauerkraut, if I remember. A lot of people don't get that. A lot of the sauerkraut that we buy is just pickled cabbage. Typically, uh, <laughs> sauerkraut is typically sauerkraut is fermented similarly to kimchi, um, so it, ta it tastes different from the stuff you buy in the store. Whereas again, the stuff that you buy in the store, they just like they take cabbage, shred it, dump pickling liquid over it. It's not the same thing. Um, and then I'm trying to think. I mean, sabayon, of course, it's like a French technique. Um, pastry. I mean, they have a lot of pastries. So and then. 
the other stuff, I'm, I'm not really sure. I guess he just likes the flavors, or because I, I don't typically think of sturgeon as being a French thing. I think of it as more as a Russian thing with the sturgeon and caviar. But I don't know. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. I'm sure in his cookbook he probably explains. Yeah. It's, it's a very, very interesting yeah. dish for sure. Yeah. And and I'm wondering with this this um, the suffix of luga because it's like beluga, it's beluga caviar. I'm wondering does luga mean something? Is luga like fish or like region or water? Is it like then the kai is actually something that modifies the luga part of it. I don't know. Um, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a lot of different types of caviar. I think um, it has, it has to do with the fish that it, um, it has to do with the fish that it can it comes from. So there's like, as you say, there's like um, kaluga. That's, um, I, I'm trying to think. It's, it, it's. Um, I think there's Kaluga. Yo, oh, yeah, I think it's a species of sturgeon. Like, I think sturgeon's a broader category, and then there's specific sturgeons, mm -hmm. and then Kaluga's a type of that. So there's like Beluga sturgeon, Kaluga sturgeon. Yeah, that sounds about yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> maybe, yeah. yeah, maybe that's some kind of different language for sturgeon that's that's actually in there. But yeah, this looks this looks great. Um, you can see the person's hand can kind of give you a sign. So this is more like a three or four bite one. Was there a price of this on the regular one or you have to get it? So this was actually available on the regular menu, right? Yeah, I think I want to say this was on the regular menu too. Um, let's see here. Let's see. Um, yeah, it's anyway like a uh, five, five, five or six bite type of thing where you're not, you're not just throwing the entire tart in your mouth. It's like, we'll figure it out. Yeah, it's, it's, like it's, uh, it's, it. it's four... It's forty two dollars on the regular menu. Yeah, it's not huge, but um, I think I had like part of it. And she ate most of it because that was her dish. Yep. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah it looks rich and flavorful. Yeah. You got the 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 pastry in there. Then you've got the the caviar with its own unique caviar -y type of mouthfeel and everything. Mm -hmm. You got the cream out there. Temperature wise, what what's going on here? It all kind of the same temperature. Is it coming out of the oven? Like what's what's it on that? So I, I would think. They probably bake it ahead because the thing is the zabayon with egg yolks, if you were to bake that, that would completely destroy it. So my guess is what they do is they probably bake the dough, then they probably put the fish on, and then the yolks, they probably heat up like towards the end because the thing is the egg yolks, typically you cook it over a water bath you with with a whisk. I mean, you could do it in a blender now too. That's like the more modern way. Um, so my guess is they bake the shell in advance. They probably put the fish in, they heat up the Zabayon last minute, put it on, then they finish with the caviar, and then they do the smoke gun thing that I described and bring it to the table. That'd be, that. That's how I would anticipate they do it, yeah. Yeah, and with this one, it's I don't know what, I'm, well, I'm not seeing the video right now, I know you sent it to me, but was it served yeah. on the same kind of plate? Or is it, this is the typical plate that they use? Was it? I, I, don't, I don't remember off the, the top of my head. The image you in the document is that white plate with kind of funnels all over it. Okay. I, I I would have to check. I don't remember, but it was made, but like the video was more to illustrate like them actually doing it where they like pull it off and they sort of like spin it in the air and, you know, just looks kind of cool. Uh -huh. Okay. Now uh, talking about plates and moving on to the next one, I can imagine yep. this was made, this plate right here was made yep. by the same people who made the plate for the, for gras. you can see it's kind of the same type yep. of uh, shell looking like a shell from the sea type of thing. Yep. But yep. here the actual, I'm more from like more focused on like, uh -huh. <laughs> Rabbits and I focus on the plates rather than the food. And the food is hay smoked duck breast with uh, eggplant puree, stuffed zucchini blossoms uh, with goat cheese and olives, and a jus poured uh, table side. Yep, sure. So I actually, again, it's not it's not right here, but I have the video of um, where they actually served both. They served me and Andrea both our entrees. And with the duck, it's kind of cool because they actually pour the jus table side last minute. So the idea is it's hot in the pan and they put it on the plate for you. Um, and then the she actually had the, again I, unfortunately i didn't take a photo of the entree i don't know why but she had a uh, trout with marinated farro zucchini spuma that's a foam and champagne sauce to finish the champagne sauce was also poor table side as well i thought that was kind of cool um the foam was put on in advance and the champagne sauce was just put over the top of the fish at the last minute um so for this duck breast i was reading it's actually uh two week dry age but it's also smoked now for those who don't know dry aging it's basically you let meat sit for a bit and it, the flavor sort of concentrated and the meat dries out so it's typically done with steak but they've done it with uh duck as well so the duck flavor is richer it's more concentrated and then they smoke it with hay i'm not sure if the smoking is done in advance or after the or after the aging, I'm not sure which they do. Um, either way, though, really flavorful uh, meat. And then the zucchini blossom, they take the blossom, they put the goat cheese and olives inside, they do like a tempura batter, and then they fry that. So when you bite into it, there's actually goat cheese inside along with olives. And then eggplant puree, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. And there was some sauteed uh, squash as well. 
Um, really nice dish. And then, yeah, hers was good too. The trout, the trout tasted like it was smoked. So that was kind of interesting as well. Yeah. Okay. And here, as you have, you've talked about with the duck breast, how they're supposed to get the, the fat to reduce and, and come off yeah. of the, with the skin. Yeah. You can see they've really gotten it down to, to that tip top level. Some of the dishes we've seen before, there's been a variation with it, but this is a Michelin two star. So it's probably things yeah. they get it wrong. They probably would not bring it out to the table or they fire that person. You leave yeah. with it and go eat it yeah. outside. You're fine. <laughs> and uh, the side on here kind of looks like its own little mini oyster type of action going on there. This is it's an interesting plate. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was, that was the squash. Blo that was the zucchini uh, blossom rather on top. But like, it was cool. Cause it had the goat cheese and olives inside. And then it was bread. It was a uh, tempura style batter than fried. So like you bite into it, you get the cheese and wow. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It was really interesting. Uh, that's amazeballs. Yeah, yeah. I just like some of these things is just really like the people who the, the thought to come behind making some of this yeah. is just really cool to kind of think of. Yeah. It's I mean it's why some of this stuff is a profession because they spend so much time in there. He's probably just like sleepy. Then he wakes up. It's like oh let me try this. Like yeah, huh? some things come together that inspire you to do something. And yeah, it's that's why I enjoy um, having these conversations. Yeah. And it's something that I mention in every series. Try to mention in every series at least once. Is part of me doing this is being able to know more about the foods. Then when I go to a restaurant, I'll be able to order things that either inspire me or things that I'm aware of that I'm probably never, ever going to be able to actually be creative enough or take the time to make something like this. So I'll make sure to order that versus something that I could probably make uh, at home or relatively easy or that might not inspire me in a certain way, especially when you're going and you're spending this level. So with Steven, he was able to look at the menu ahead of time and, <laughs> and already salivate and be ready for certain mm -hmm. dishes that he picked out kind of ahead of time. So yeah, it's... Uh, it's good stuff. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I, I wish I, I wish I had taken a photo of Andrea's entree, but we do have the video which we can put up. It was it was really nice as well. Again, I, I generally prefer meat to fish, but that that was really good though. I like smoked trout personally. I think it's kind of nice. Uh. <clears throat> yeah. So we, yeah, with that one, there, there will be a screen cap, and the video is on the screen as well. So that one you would have seen if you actually are watching it, and uh, you will see the plate that was there. So we don't have that video on hand right now as I'm going through this. So um, hmm, what was the price of this one? Was it on the regular menu? Uh, I'd have to check here. Um, yes. Yeah. So this would be. Oh wait, sorry. No wait, that's duck. Hold on, that's. No, I see. There's duck confit leg, but I got, I got, uh, I got duck breast. Um, yeah. So now this so is a, might be a specific pre-free one. Pre yeah. Fix. Yeah. This is this is something you'd have to get the yeah you'd have to get the pre-free. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, and uh, tell us a bit about the wine, the vino. Sure. So this is a Barolo. For those that don't know, that don't know, that's a Nebbiolo grape. It's from a particular region. Um, I, I was thinking about Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is typically paired with duck, but I, I don't know. It's almost kind of cliche. So I wanted something a little different. I haven't had Barolo <laughs> in a little while. Yeah. Well, it, it's I wanted it like it's sort of like like a lot of people do like muscat or sauterne with foie gras, but it's like I'm not going to get that every time because it's like it gets boring. Like it's nice to have something that's a little like you know off the beaten path or like like it still works, but it's not as well known. Um, Barolo, it's it tends to be a little bit of a pricier wine because again, it's it's the Nebbiolo grape. Um, it's it's from the northern. Um, it's in Piemonte. It's in that region. Um, it's it's actually what's one of the most popular Italian wines for sure. Um, it's interesting. It actually has some sort of like uh, earthier elements, but also some floral elements. Um, a little bit of fruit, but it typically has more of an earthier element. Like some people will describe it as having tar. Uh, some people will actually describe like leather belt. Like, yeah, there's some, it's a very, it's a very, uh, very nuanced wine. So it pairs well with a lot of things. Um, sure. They said it's a, uh, yeah, they tend to they tend to take uh, it's 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 the Nebbiolo grape. It's that region, and they said um, it can take up to ten years to age to drink. So that's why it's pricier because it's like only so much is made in those certain regions. So it's like like Barolo at a store, you're probably going to spend at least forty bucks a bottle for. Whereas like you can get a lot of other yeah. stuff for cheaper. Like like champagne, similar thing. Like the process with champagne, you're probably spending at least fifty bucks a bottle in a store. But because it has to be from that region, a certain blend made in that certain method, it's like that's why. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cost benefit analysis. You pay for what you get in most cases. Yeah. We actually come down to in the actual in an actual market. You normally command what, what you are worth eventually. Because if somebody else can make it for cheaper, or if somebody else can sell it for more, they will be doing that. Like if you actually just let enough people choose to, to what to, what they're going to do. 
But yeah, you can listen to a lot of our other conversations that get a lot deeper into those topics and our future conversation on uh, Human Action by Ludwig von Mises. But yeah, what, what, so, sorry, one, one, one story, one comment I had on Barolo that was funny was Trader Joe's actually had one for cheaper. And I told um, I told the sommelier at Felidia that and he didn't believe it was real. He's like, you're sure that's Barolo? <laughs> he's like, it's not Barolo with two B's or with two L's or something. <laughs> Because he's like, he's like, that seems like a little too cheap. But like, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe they found a way to produce, or like, maybe it's not aged as long, or because like, there was a story about, you know, they always think of Chianti, like you know, made famous by Silence of the Lambs, but like how Chianti, it used, it's the San Giovese grape, but it was the Chianti region. But then what happened was because people wanted to produce more of it, they're like, okay, for to be the original, it has to be Chianti Classico, and then to be a certain quality, it's Chianti Classico Reserva, and then the other stuff isn't like the real original Chianti. So they, they try to find ways around it to re, to produce it. But like, then the other people are like, wait, this isn't the real stuff. So you have to call it something else. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think in, in with something like Trader Joe's, knowing a little bit about their background, it's, and also being a supermarket, this kind of things, it's, it's a, there's a technical term for this. I don't know. It's not cost, cost leader or cost loser. It, there's, there's a term of where you get a certain product. You've mentioned it also before in certain things. Certain things are given on a menu that they know they're taking a loss on it, but it's going to get people in there. It's going to get people to come to the actual place. Well, well, with something like Trader Joe's, my guess is that because they buy so much stuff, they probably get a discount. And the other thing they yeah. do is they're, they're like, I've seen this even like even in like Netta is like if you're if you order amounts of certain things, you get discounts on other things. So maybe they have some deal worked out with the purveyors where they're like, okay, we'll buy this cheaper one from you. Uh, we'll buy a lot of it. Then like, okay, give us a discount on the Barolo so we can charge a little less yeah. and people will buy them. Like they find these arrangements like that. Yeah. 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 Um, they, they could even be selling it at cost, but they Trader Joe's as y'all who have been there might know has also it's a seasonal type of thing in some cases. Like, like seventy five percent, seventy to seventy five percent of what their of their products will be there all the time. But then they have constant rotating things. So, like you said, they might have come into a relationship. With someone say like for the next two years, you give us all your Barolo, and then that's good to get people in there. And then people yeah. will come, and most people who get wine, they're not just good to get just the Barolo. But they could have been somebody who really likes Barolo, who's never found it anywhere else besides at restaurants and things like this. Oh, it's a Trader Joe's, and they'll start buying a Trader Joe's, and then Trader Joe's will become their main wine place because they'll find other wines that Trader Joe's actually making a lot more profit off of. So I think that's it's, it makes sense that they would they would do stuff like that. And well, well, despite it, some of their social political things, I like Trader Joe's from my experience. But yeah, go ahead. Because some of the stuff like at Netta, like I remember if like we bought so much sake, we'd get a discount on the Japanese whiskeys, which are pricier. But then because of that, we could charge a little less money so that we can be like, hey, we're charging less for, you know, Yamazaki eight or whatever than this place it then like our competitors are so then you'll come in then those people will order more of those but because there's still a markup we make more money because it's it's sort of the supply side thing of like you lower the cost but like longer run you make more money because it's at a lower price so people just order more of it so things like that you know was it branded with its actual like the from the winery that it came from or was it Trader Joe's branded um, I think it was. I think it was the winery it came from, but I forget. This was like a few years ago now. Uh. Yeah, as, and actually, it's called loss leader. Loss leader is a pricing strategy where a product is sold at price, um, sold at price below its market cost to stimulate other sales uh, of more profitable goods. And yeah, like you say, Barolo is a name. If if somebody in the restaurant is like, "Wow, you can't believe you get that," that that probably got around. You probably weren't the only person telling somebody else. Yeah, there was a lot cheaper Barolo at, uh, at, at Trader yeah. Joe's. Probably got got the word around and got some people into the place. So good for them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now moving on to Z desserts. Yep. And the first one we have here is a stone fruit frappe brulee, which is peach marmalade, apricot sorbet, and beer frappe brulee and spice cake. Now here, I was talking about the four C's that Stephen has told me about, coffee, caramel, citrus, and chocolate that's normally included in desserts. It's suggested to be included, but there was some skipping back and forth, as I mentioned before, with the freezing. So we're just going to jump back in right after he's heard me say some of these things, but he didn't pick them all up. Really type of place, and peach, to me, peach and apricots. They're kind of sort of citruses, but that's what stone fruits are for those people who don't know. It's not a, it's not a fruit called stone fruit, but when a fruit has... When a fruit has the big stone in it, it's called a stone fruit. And hopefully you heard what I said, but we're having some internet issues with, with the recording yeah. today. 
Yeah, you were sort of in and out, but I heard you. So this this was a very interesting dish. So what it is, is there was actually a little spice cake in the bottom of it. They don't mention it on the menu, but it's in there. And then there's apricot sorbet. Um, there's peach marmalade, so you can tell it's like based off peaches. Um, usually there's the uh, the skin included as well. Um, apricot, yeah, apricot sorbet. And then on top, there's actually this uh, foam, typically uh, frappe. It's more of like a coffee thing. Like usually it's like ice down there's usually yeah it's mixed up but what it is is they uh they make it actually with beer and they actually put uh these little caramel uh pieces into it it was really nice um i thought i thought it was real it was a really nice dessert um you know not as impressive as the next one in terms of presentation but uh it would t- it tasted great though and it's, it was a nice summertime thing because um finishing you know finishing the summer with the stone fruit so yeah you know we you don't really have citrus in here but you do have the caramel and um yeah that, that would that would be the only c here so yeah <laughs> and it's kind of served in a coffee cup kind of presentation, so we can, yeah. we can kind of give it a 0.5 for the coffee-ish. <laughs> it's coffee-ish, so it's kind of in there. Now, okay, so there's the, the coldness of, of the of the um, sorbet on there, and is, is the spice cake itself warm? No, it's not. So my, okay. my it, it was probably about room temperature, so my guess is they probably bake them in advance and put them in, like, and then they just put, like, the ice cream and stuff last minute. That'd be my, the, the sorbet, I mean, yeah. And what's the density? Is it like a fruit cake, like a rum cake, or is it more like airy, like uh, fluffy uh, stuff? It's um, it was something between those. It, it's the kind of thing like it's the kind of thing I feel like you have around holiday time. Um, okay. It's the kind of thing like if you were to have it, you'd probably like have had something similar before. Um, I'm not sure what they call it. I mean, it's called a spice cake because that's what it reminds me of. But you no, know. maybe like a pound cake or something like that kind of. Yeah, pretty close. Pretty close to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Again, with the plating, as you mentioned, there's some interesting platings that we're going to keep seeing with these as it is a higher-end place, even putting thought into why they do things in a certain way, why they don't just bring this out in a bowl. But it's like, oh, let's give it a bowl. Let's put uh-huh. it out there in the bowl. And you can see also with, as you mentioned, the whole frappe type of thing, it's usually a coffee thing. And now it's taking the coffee out of it, but still given the presentation of coffee. So there's going to be people who have this who are normally familiar with the frappe and things like that. So it's also knowing your customer base and just... Uh, yeah, making a good product, but that's 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 why you get these higher level places. It's not just yep. paying off the Michelin people. Uh, yeah. uh, sure. Okay, now next again, like I, I'm I'm actually going, I'm taking a note down. <laughs> if I find out who makes these plates, I'll do a slight check. I think I'll I'll give 15 minutes of my uh, of my internet sleuthing time to try and track down the the people who make the plates from you. Or maybe next time you go, you can just ask them. Like you say, like you're you're doing this recording thing. Yeah, that's what you'll do. Next time you go here, I'm not going to look. Next time you go, because you will go back, right? Chances are you're going to go back. Yeah. It's like 50-50? Oh, I, I, I'm going to go back. I'm just debating on when, because like I say, the price is it's like maybe like next month or something, or if there's a celebration. Okay. I, told, I told my parents that after like some of the stocks squeeze and I do really well, I want to take them here. But it's like I'd be paying the whole bill, because like I know even my okay. dad looking at the prices, he'd freak out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. So that's what I'm going to do. Instead of I'm scratching that out, I'm not going to spend my 15 minutes. If This is the kind of thing I like. We live on social media. A lot of times when people have phones, if I'm coming up to something, I like asking. If I have a question, I'll – not me just go online and ask the question. You literally – I don't understand why people don't do this often. You literally just type the question is, what is X? How do you do Y? Where is Z from? Literally just type that in any search engine, and you can find some results from it. But then it's also just a simple thing of asking people. So in this situation, if I can, instead of me going online and doing it, you're going to go back. And it's also a teaser for the next time, once we get back to Gabriel Caruther, come back and we shall open that talk up with, I'm writing down that we shall open that talk up somewhere in the, in the intro of it. Stephen will tell us when he asks them about where they get these plates from, because they're amazing plates. But that's that's been a whole... <laughs> I mean, a whole rigmarole. Uh, the food has been on the screen, uh, and it's a Concord grape uh, vacherin, which is Vacheron. pistachio vacherin, which is a pistachio ice cream, Concord grape sorbet, a chantilly, and vanilla and grape meringue. Yeah. So one one comment about your thing about search engines. I used to yell at Dina for this because like she would be talking to me online and she would keep asking me what words mean. And I'm like, you're sitting at a computer with vastly more. <laughs> like, why do you keep asking me? Just go on Google look. But anyway. Yeah. Um, for, for me personally, that's what if I'm if I'm talking yeah. to somebody online, especially talking debating certain issues, I ask them what do they mean, and then they yeah. say like, oh. Go, go look online. It's not my job to educate you. I'm like, no, I cannot look online. If I'm talking to you, person X, I can't type online, unless you're some public figure, I can't type online and say, what does X think about this when they say Y? 
I'm asking you what the hell you mean about X topic. So tell me what you actually mean, not what somebody else. Anyway, it's, it's, that's frustrating because there's, there's the two sides of that. People who don't look and then the people who think everything can be found on it. It can't. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, so Vacheron is actually a type of cheese. It's either French or Swiss. It's uh, based on cow, cow milk. It's fresh. Um, so this is actually a very interesting dessert. So what they did here was pistachio ice cream, the grape sorbet. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. And they actually did um, two. They did meringue, but what they did was they whipped it up. They put it. They laid it out flat and then made it into uh, pieces that they broke up. So there's a vanilla meringue and a grape meringue. And then um, there's a grape. I want to say it's a puree here. There's a uh, fresh grapes and then the, the white there's actually two separate things here so the one on our left is actually chantilly which is uh basically just whipped cream and then the vacheron is on the right that's actually the cheese itself so it's the cheese but it's um it's a little it's not overly sweet but it sort of pairs with the other stuff so you have like you know grape vanilla pistachio meringue very interesting dessert i love the presentation of this yeah on the right was the cheese and on the left said there was a no what you said there was a cheese Right? Yeah. So Vacheron is I so on on our left is the Chantilly, oh, yeah, the, the whipped cream. That's and then on the right is the Vacheron, the cheese itself. So it's not it's not overly sweet because there's a lot of sweet stuff on the dish. But like sometimes people will do that. Like they'll put cheese in a dessert and it'll be like it's not salty, but it's more on the savory side to sort of offset some of the sugar. So there's a little more depth of flavor there. Yeah. And what's the what's the history behind that circle? You you've said the name of it over and over again. You said it's something that you definitely learn when you work at at, at one of these higher end restaurants. Or the, the more oh. the more expensive restaurants. Why do they do that scoop and that kind of thing? Tell us the name of it. Okay. Canel, I think it just people just think it looks more elegant because I think uh, like if you go to a casual place, it's just like the ball with an ice cream scoop, but that's more casual. This takes a little bit of finesse to make it look nicer. Like I said, I got pretty good at it, but I used to do it all the time. That's why um, it looks like like I think if you if you were to picture like a cake or something and you see one of those on top rather than like a uh, round scoop, like the scoop just looks like I don't know too casual or something. Like you get that when you go to yeah, like you get that when you go to like your local ice cream spot, whereas this is supposed to be a little more refined. Yeah. Okay. And one thing that you often see at some of these dishes, and you can see where the restaurants have been going, is that technique of having the same ingredient but in in rather different forms. Like here, you can see you have the fresh grapes actually just cut there in the halves, and even just the halves themselves. I like sometimes peeling grapes. I like sometimes cutting them in half, putting them in desserts and things, not in desserts, in salads and things like this. It's one of my favorite foods to include in vegetable salads. But for most people, the way they mostly eat grapes is just the entire grape as its own. So even having them in these halves is a new different thing for many people. And now you have the grape and then now you have the grape sorbet. You have those two things together. So you kind of get that same fruit, that same thing, but in different kind of flavors, a different kind of mouthfeels. And I think that's a common thing that you'll see in a lot of these higher end restaurants, even just the higher end, even the mid range restaurants, that it's it's something that a lot of chefs try to do. They'll do this, they'll do like a like a foam and a and a cracker version of it. Yeah. Or they'll do like a seared version, and then they'll do like a like like a granulated version. But they try to yeah. have two different things in something and it's it's an interesting technique that I think is is worth noting. Yeah, so like you figure for grape, there's four things here because you have fresh grape, grape puree, grape sorbet, grape meringue. You know, mm -hmm. so the meringue, yeah. it's like they probably whip up the meringue. There's probably juice or puree mixed into it. What they do is they probably they lay it out, they dry it out, usually in a dehydrator, and then it becomes crunchy. Then you just break off the pieces and put it on the plate. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a great looking dish. Yeah. And yeah, was this was one really on the nice. regular menu? Uh, let me check actually. Um. Let's see. It's on. Let's see. It's on the prefix. Let me check the regular though. But now making um, this one, as you mentioned, this would be a bit of a difficult to making the different kind of things. It might, the things might be easy to make on your own, but then now having all of them for one dish, that's the amount yeah. of time and effort that goes into do it, especially this little amount of it, is kind of yeah. the thing where for me, this would be definitely something I would order because like the time that I would cut grapes, make a meringue, make a puree, like, do all those things together, I chances would be doing that at home for myself with slim to none. So this is definitely a, a two, two order when you get to a place like this. Yeah, it's, tw it's $22. Dollars. The um, the the frappe is on the a la carte menu as well. Um, yeah, and this go what you just said goes to my recurring point about like if you just want to make one of these components, you could do that. Like you could even make like grape meringue crisps. You could pipe them out and snack on them, or you could do like the pistachio ice cream. Serve it with something else because the way the way it works in these kitchens is that usually there's a pastry chef and a team of cooks. So like different people prep different things, and when it comes time to plate, you put it all together. So it's like a lot of the prep and then the timing of getting it right because you have to figure. Um, 
the Chantilly, like the whipped cream will sort of settle over time. So you put it last minute and then like the ice cream will start to melt. So you have to time it. So it's like ice cream goes last minute. And then um, if you have dishes where there's like a hot cake or something, you have to t synchronize it where it's like you bake the hot cake, put it on the plate, do ice cream and a few other things and then send it out because, um, you know, you, you don't want it to be a mess at the table. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so one more look over on this one. Um, hmm. Now, wait, we did mention the C's. Now, again, I guess you can kind of say grapes are kind of citrusy, because where, uh. is the, where is the C? <laughs> None of the C's are here, but it's still, the, if, you, if you're not going to include the C's, do something like this and blow, blow those C's out of there. Like, you don't need no C's here. Yeah. <laughs> Any of those four C's here. Just knock them out, knock them out of the park. So yeah, that's 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 an amazing looking dish, and yeah, um, yeah. you said this one was the one she got, or you got this? She got, of course. We tried each okay. each dish. Yeah. Okay, okay. So now moving on to the last one, and these are petit four. You've told us about these before. You'll tell us a bit about them again here, and just the general dish itself. But then these ones, um, the first one is uh, coffee flavored with caramel on top. So that's two yep. of the C's, and um, the middle one has said cardamom cream. The middle one, so that's the one. Is that the one with like a with a little white on it? And yeah, you said the middle one, but there's there's no third one. So there's two. There's two different. You, you uh, uh, yeah, one, I, I miss. I, I, it's, I, it's, I misspoke. I meant the one that's on the right. Yeah. Okay, so this this top one. Um, yeah, so again, these are seem to be. You're not supposed to eat the beans. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. If, I wonder if there's anyone who who gets this at the table, and then they've brought in the dish and they try to eat some of the beans. I'm guessing like the the beans are just there for the flavor and the look of the presentation yeah. of it, right? So this and, actually uh, has. The, the bottom, this, sorry. Sorry, I was, was going to say this actually has three. Sorry, uh, this this actually has three of the C's because there's chocolate, coffee, and caramel. Yeah. So the only thing you're missing is citrus. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, so with that with that top one is a little metal dish. So they come and they bring it on the table covered, and they kind of open it up like a little gift and. Yeah, and it looks like a hand. Probably this doesn't look like a. I mean, but now they have tech, they have techniques to mass produce things that look like they're handmade. But that could probably be handmade with a couple of different ones. And then the second one looks like it's in some kind of like wood carved dish, and that one has the cocoa beans on it. And that is it's also on a on a thin um, layer of chocolate as well for the for the one on the bottom. Yeah. So that's uh, it's like a little like wooden receptacle with the cocoa nibs, and then there's the flat piece and the two pieces on top. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about these, starting with the top. Sure. One. So, so petit four for those who don't know, it actually means small oven in French. I like to think it's kind of like the reverse end of the amuse bouche, where amuse bouche it's something to sort of wake up your palate that you have before your meal. This is something they give you after the dessert, just to sort of snack on and like finish the meal out. Um, so you order desserts and they bring these to the table. You know, they pull off the lid and everything. So. This first one here, it's a uh, it's a bit of a wafer underneath. There's the middle. It's almost like a um, it's a coffee flavored. I don't know if mousse is the right word. I'm not sure. It's a little thicker. It's it's not as thick as, I mean, it's solid enough to hold its shape. It's not as thick as caramel. Like it's not like caramel or something, but it's like something between like a mousse and a caramel in terms of consistency. Some caramel crisps on top, a little bit of the gold flakes again, um, and then the bottom one here. It's this is a piece of chocolate on bottom, the flat piece. The one on the left. I'm trying to think if. The, Trying to remember, I wish I'd written it down. I think there was caramel or something in the left one, and this right one is more of a cream-based thing that tastes like uh, cardamom. And I was saying I really enjoy that because I think cardamom is kind of an underrated ingredient. And it's cool to see it in a dessert like that. Yeah, yeah we've talked about we talked about in the previous one. We also talked about yeah. the previous series. We talked about the gold flakes. We kind of poo pooed on that a bit because it's an overuse of that. Like there's just like a steak, which is like a typical steak, but then the steak is just entirely covered with yeah. gold flakes. But then the the dessert that we talked about in the seasonal series starts in the cover of that one, that one was used in a more tasteful manner, but when you just like cover the entire thing or, oh, we're having a milkshake with all sorts of things on it. We're gonna add some gold flakes to it and add like $50 to the bill. I'm like, eh. But yeah, here you can see it's kind of tastefully used, just some, a bit of sprinkling on it. And I'm guessing these ones just, just pick up the entire piece and toss it in your mouth. So it's not yeah. something that you can really necessarily yeah. share. So which one did you have and which one did she, I mean, did she have? Well, we actually, um, with the one on the top, we each had a piece, and with the bottom one, I think we br we broke this into pieces, and we just each had like about half. Because okay. um, yeah, because I'm sure I'm sure if you sit with more people, they'd probably bring out like another plate worth or something. But yeah, because they're they're uh, relatively small, the small, small, yeah. small things. And the other petit four that we saw was um, was it Casamono or was it Huertas? 
Yeah, I think it may have been no, no, it would have been DB Bistro. Been like I think. A, yeah, yeah, DB Bistro. Yeah. And it was that was more cake like it was like almost like a small tiny rum or yeah. fruit type of thing. Oh, it was so, the uh the financiers, the um it's like a it was like a cake. I'm trying to think there was pistachio or what, and then there was uh cherries and like sugar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, because it used to be the, made for uh the French bankers, yeah. Oh right, sorry, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, and yeah, because that's that's how it started. But then now Petit Four has changed. Now it's it doesn't have to be necessarily cake based. Because right? I was thinking, oh, it's, these are all cake based. But here you can see some that don't even have the wheat or the cake or the yeah. bread type of based in. And uh, this other one now it looks like that's like half like a macaron. And uh, you you mentioned this before macaron. We might have talked about this before. The macaron and the macaron, which is like the coconut yeah. basing, and then there's the one which looks like a small little like fluffy cake, fluffy sandwich, cake sandwich thing. I don't understand why those two names are so familiar with such different kind of kind of like foods. I'm like, just, come on, dude, one of you, one of you pick one, and one of you just go somewhere else. Like it's it's I, I don't like that, but hey, whatever. So. Uh- I love macarons. Uh, the, he actually he sells them in the chocolate place. So I was thinking about buying some at some point. They get expensive though. I mean, even if you go to places that aren't that like, yeah, even if you go to places that aren't that fancy, you'll get a box of a few. It's like twenty bucks. So like, I don't, I, I can't even imagine how much he charges. But um, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure the flavors are excellent. But you know, it's like you do spend a bit of money. But there's a bit of finesse in making them because. The outside shell, it's like it's very thin, delicate, and crunchy, so it's hard to get just right because if it's too thick, it's not crunchy, and then if it's too thin, it falls apart. So it's getting that exact finesse, and then the filling, of course, um, the filling uh, depends on like you know what's available. Um, let me see. I'm actually going to check on his uh, website now on the Gabriel Kreuzer chocolate. Check and see if they can actually get yeah. it because the chocolate one. I know I tried loading it was not having issues, but I don't know if that's this slow connection that we're dealing with the recording or that it has issues to do. Right now, as we're recording this, there are some social media sites are having some internet downings, and then also there's been a local warning here in Nairobi, Kenya, of some fiber optics being adjusted in some highway being rebuilt. So there's different issues to deal with. That um, oh, I, I, got, I got it here. So. If you go to the pastry section, there's actually cheesecake macaron, 12 pieces, 38 bucks. That's actually not terrible for him. Um, 24 pieces, $65. I mean, that's uh, that's probably – I mean, I, I think I've gone to bakeries upstate and probably paid like – I'll spend like 20 bucks and maybe get like eight or something. So I guess like that's not terrible. I mean, when you consider you – know? I'm sure I'm sure the quality – I'm sure that – yeah, because I think I have 20 bucks for like eight and then you figure 65 for 24 – that's not. I mean, that's not terrible, and I'm sure the quality is solid. Knowing him, so. Yeah. They said with this chocolate, it's a different site, right? It's not at the location. Do they make it in? Is it like a kitchen in the back where they make the chocolates on site, or do they make it in a factory somewhere else, ship them in? Do you know anything about that? I think I think it's right next to the place. I got to check. Um, I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure. Like I say, they probably make some stuff, send it to the restaurant. Other stuff, you just go in and buy it. Uh, I might go take a look. I mean, I've been trying to cut out sugar, so it's not something I eat regularly. But maybe like next time I see my family, buy some from them or something. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. They got, they, got um, some, so, they got some cool uh, truffles and other things here too, and like you know, boxes of chocolates and yeah, really cool stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, so what was this? These bottom ones. What the flavor? Is that actually just a chunk of chocolate on top, like on? Next to the white one, you said the, the white one is the, the Macron, but uh, what's this other one besides the, a, a little block of there, chocolate? I'm trying to remember if there was caramel or something in there. There was a filling. I'm trying to remember. I think it was caramel or something. And then the bottom was just like a solid piece of chocolate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Good stuff. And yeah, again, I really like the, the choice of platings, the things that they've used to do these. Yeah. But yeah. And I think that's it for today. Yeah. It's been a bit longer than the normal recordings that we do. We normally aim for an hour and a half, but if we're yeah. around the hour and a half area and we can get to the end of whatever it is that we're talking about, we like finishing those off. As yeah. mentioned, uh, we're back on the screen now. Uh, today, I just posted the last month's season now, and this one will be up next week. And we've already had a few other things in, in mind of <laughs> continuing on with different series. As Stephen had mentioned, the end of the season now one, possibly Netta, possibly Barb. This is Barbara Lude, right? Uh, probably Felidia, because Felidia, yeah. I have a bunch of nice pictures. Um, I'm thinking about Casa Lua now. That, Casa Lua would be a shorter video, but I have some older stuff. I went um, yesterday, and then my friend Andrea and I are probably, we're probably going to go on Wednesday. So it's like I'll have like a few different things to talk about. Uh, yeah. But that'll be probably. Cheeses. I have a few small plates. I have a few desserts. So that'll that'll probably even be shorter than that'll be shorter than this one. But I think it'll there's enough content there to discuss. Yeah, it, you know? 
Then we'll see. We'll see. The Casa de Luan, I've used that beautiful cheese footage before. We're using the stuff for the website, but he's recorded his own beautiful cheese footage, and you'll have more of that. And that may be interesting to finally bring somebody else on this series. So possibly after this one, it's going to be one of those two restaurants, or we might see if Andrea wants to join us and actually talk about uh, their, their experience at Casa Lula. But otherwise, tell us a little bit more about this. This is something you thought of doing before. You said this is your first uh, Michelin two-star restaurant. What was your expectations to go in? Like, when did you first hear about this place? Like, I know we we initially talked about finding the menu and seeing it was open again at, a couple of weeks back, and you were looking at certain dishes, and you were very rather relatively excited. So, just tell us a bit more about your experience of of. Uh, well, this place. I've known about it for some time. I mean, I mean, I used to go to the modern when he was the chef there. So I always like sort of knew about him that when he opened his own place, I thought it was cool. But at the time I didn't have money for it. You know, now I'm doing a little better. So I was thinking about going there, but I, I looked at the prices. I thought, I mean, it's not cheap, obviously, but I mean, like for the quality of food you get and the amount, like, I don't think it's unreasonable because I was, I was arguing a little bit with Rose the other day where she was talking about, uh, well, she and Andrea were both like, oh, I like Croyther a lot more than Manetta Tavern, but I'm like, yeah, but you spend like twice as much money at Croyther. It's like, yeah, like the food's a little more in depth and intricate as you see, but you spend like twice as much money. That's my thing about Manetta. I can go like once a week, they send me some stuff. I spend like a hundred something. This was like 200 something. So it's like, I wouldn't come back here every week. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, could I afford it? Yeah, but do I want to spend the money? Not really. So, but like, I feel in both cases, the money you spend is what, like, you get what you pay for. Like, cause like, um, I don't know if you saw my post where I went to Minetta with Andrea, but like, we got three appetizers and entrees and we shared it all and we each spent like a hundred something bucks and we each got some wine too. Here it's like we each spent 200 something, but we got three and four courses. She got one glass of wine, I got two. So it's like, Again, I mean, the food's more intricate, but again, both paces, I feel like you get what you pay for. That's what it comes down to for me. Like, again, I mean, my Mexican place on the corner, I go, I spend 40, 50 bucks, but it's like, it's decent, like, you know, like it's decent food for what it is, but it, like, that's a place I can go regularly because it's cheap. So it's like, for me, it's about, it's, it's about the value you pay proportionate to what the type of food is. That's how I see it. Yeah. 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 And was it what you expected? You, was there anything that really surprised you that you had some ideas that this might taste this way or this might be this way than once you actually got there? You're like, oh, this is actually uh, relatively different than what you'd expected. Or was it around what you did? And this doesn't mean good or bad, but just in general, was there anything that was aside from your expectations or you specifically was like, wow, this is this is very new? Not really. I mean, I had some ideas about his style of cooking because, again, I ate at the Modern and a lot of those were like his dishes. So, like, I had an idea of what, like, his type of cooking was so some of the flavors I thought were kind of interesting, like the duck with like the squash blossom, like that was kind of out of the blue. And then like um, the dessert, of course, again, I thought was really impressive. Um, I think I mentioned actually he came out before we ate. I thought that was kind of cool. I wanted to say hi, but he was on his phone. And then <laughs> towards the end, toward, well, towards the end of the night, he was talking to the GM at the bar. And I thought about saying hi, but like it would have been kind of weird, like coming up to him. And, you know, but um, I was like, I thought that was a good omen. And I want to check out his cookbook. I'm sure there's a lot of really good stuff in there. Um, I, again, I mean, I love Alsatian cooking. I love that Germanic influence plus the French stuff. And, um, you know, his he, he, he's, he, I'd imagine he has a great palate, like all these different flavors he's able to combine. And it's like, it's very memorable. Yeah. Yeah. So take yeah. us a little bit back to the foie. You've, you're, you're a bit of a foie meister. You are foie. So tell us about this foie. Like where, where does it now rank on your I, – I know we've talked about having favorites, but is it one of the better kind of uh, foies that you've had? And you said was it relatively different than what you've seen in other places? Well, yeah, with the cocoa nibs thing was definitely new. I hadn't seen that before. Um, it's funny because, you know, I've gone out with Andrea to eat a few times and she was saying that this was actually her favorite foie preparation because she had the one at Huerta's. We had one at um, we had one at what well, express. It's like a Belgian diner, but they serve like French food. And I think we had foie one somewhere else. She said this was her favorite out of those. And I would say out of the hot foie gras preparations, I would say it's probably one of my top ones. Um, I feel like hot and cold are kind of hard to compare. Like I like to break it up hot versus cold foie gras because yeah. the preparations are different. The accompaniments are different. So like, I guess it'd be, it'd be kind of like comparing like a burger to a steak. Like, yeah, it's cow, but it's like, it's prepared way differently. So it's like, sure. you can't, you can't really compare them in a way. Um, but as far as hot preparations, this is definitely one of the better ones. I would say, um, I like, I like peaches a lot. I like the roasted peaches. Um, I think I love grilled and roasted fruit. Like I love grilled watermelon. I love uh, roasted peaches. Like I think it brings out a lot of flavor. And sometimes if you do it over a charcoal grill, it adds that flavor too, which is kind of nice. Yeah. That's true. This is one of these. I know these things are set up. It's, it was one of those Hell's Kitchen. It wasn't Hell's Kitchen. It was one where 
where Ramsey actually go to different people's kitchens and at, at restaurants or hotels, and somebody had done some grilled lettuce, and he was like, "What is this? What oh, is yeah. this? What is this?" Yeah. I was like, "Yeah, that was kind of funny." But yeah, definitely grilling fruits and different things. This, this, these kind of inspiration things where you see something like, "Wow, they can do this with that," and then you try it at home, and you can find some really, some really interesting things, some really inspirational things from this. I think grilled watermelon is really underrated because the thing with watermelon is when you grill it, it gets like a caramelized outside because of the sugar content and the water seeps out a little. So the texture change changes like there's a lot you could do with that. Like you could do smaller pieces and it could be like almost crunchy. You can do a thick piece and like it'll be crunchy on the outside and soft when you cut into it. Um, you know, I, I think I think a lot of that stuff should be explored further, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and eventually we shall get to more where some of these we're finding time won't be as frequent as the conversation, but it might be. Maybe sometimes we'll skip in the conversation. We will, we'll test out different things you know, from our own kitchens or try to actually emulate some of the things that we've met out there or even do like things in person where we make like a dish and then we have people over and we talk about different foods and things like that. So growing this along with other different things that we have and if you've enjoyed this conversation, like we always do, <laughs> like there's a lot of other content with the UR We Consume series, of course, many other restaurants that we've talked about specifically in the Dish and Dish. And then there's a lot of other content where we get more into like politics, current affairs, random things with history, getting into science, just talking about regular typical things. Uh, this extreme assist content that might get people banned off of certain places, <laughs> but, but it's what we do, it's what we enjoy doing, it's what we'll be doing a lot more of. And we got a big thanks to you guys, gals, and everything else in between that have been coming along with us and will keep keep being with us as we enjoy sharing these conversations that we have with y'all out there. But yeah, anything you want to say to the people, Stephen? No, no, I mean, I, I hope you enjoyed it. Again, definitely go back. I mean, this is one of those things we'll probably talk about way down the line if we do because it was so recent. Um, I have a lot more stuff from Annette Tavern. I want to resume that as well. But like, you know, again, take it, it's been a little bit since we've done that, but I still have a bunch of other restaurants we haven't talked about at all. So I figured talk about those and eventually come back to Mineta, eventually come back to this. But it's it's cool. Though. I mean, it's it's cool to like, you know, our first Mineta presentation. Now I look at how much more stuff I have since then. So like there's a whole other <laughs> video and then and who knows? I mean, maybe there's more stuff down the line. So it's, you know, it's a lot of fun. It's good. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's it for me. This has been yep. Silas. This has been Dish on Dish. This was Gabriel Caruda. And uh, that's Stephen Thomas Kushner over there saying what's up to the people. There'll be links below to his Instagram where you can follow him for the other food that we previews to the stuff that's coming in this series and the other content and things that we talk about. And we'll be building up this platform more. As I mentioned, there will be, I think I mentioned that in this conversation, that we'll have a location where it says focus on the food. Right now, you can also check chefnetop.carbon33.com. For now, that will be one of the locations you can come to just the food interested content that we have here. And then we'll, we'll talk about more getting other things specific for this. But yeah. Sure. All right. That's all. That's all. I all hope right. you enjoyed. Bye-bye, uh, yeah. everyone. Goodbye.